So, of course, white supremacy, according to the code, goes through four stages. This system. Establishment, that's getting it started. Maintenance, that's keeping it going. Expansion, that's taking in more people. That's the third stage. And there's more people on earth now than that was, say, a thousand years ago. So it's always taking in more people because the system's already in place. If you're born in the world, wherever you are, and you're black, you're born under the system of white supremacy because that's what that means. They are in charge every place if you're on this planet and you're black. There's no place that they're not in charge. If anybody can think of one, they can correct it. Nigeria, Belize, Jamaica, Cincinnati, Ohio, Brazil, will be in charge. Now, is anything wrong with somebody in white who is white being in charge? No. Just because they're white? No. It's what they do with being white. If they're mistreating people, then that's white supremacy. That's, I can tell you what to do, and not only that, I can force you to do things or not do things just based on I'm white and you are non-white because I said so. And the white supremacist does the categorizing. They make all classifications or they will recognize them according to what they say. I have here a news clipping out of the federal page, Washington Post, Monday, August the 13th, 2001. Now, 1870, there were three categories. Well, actually, yeah, three. No, 1860. White, black, and mulatto. In the year 2000, starting at the top, always white. White's always at the top. As long as you've got that category, doesn't make any difference what kind of other categories you have or how many. Doesn't mean a thing. Just means you ain't valid. <laughs> See, if you're not white, then you are others. A bunch of junk. That's what these categories really mean. Okay, so 2000, you had white, black, second, black, African American, or Negro. That's three you can choose from. Chinese, American Indian, or Alaska Native, Japanese, Filipino, Asian Indian, Korean. Context of white supremacy. Justice, Gusty Renegade, in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, Thanks all for tuning in to the broadcast. Uh, Today's date, Wednesday, November 27th, 2013. So I have been told. I hope everybody is remaining safe and warm. Uh, I know lots of folks, at least uh, in different parts, of the U.S. are having uh, terrible weather this week. Thankfully, that is not I. Uh, It's actually pretty nice here. It's been uh, unpleasant for a few days, but it is sunny, nice, no rain, uh, not even that many clouds. But if any of the listeners out there are having a tough time, stay warm, stay safe. I hope you got enough supplies and goodies that you do not have to be tromping around outside in uh, inclement weather. Uh, At any rate, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, We will be, I guess this is two consecutive days, so we are a little bit outside of our normal broadcast time. Uh, Tomorrow, we will just be an hour earlier than normal. Uh, It'll be 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, uh, she'll be joining us once again, author of the ISIS Papers. Uh, Always a hoot to have her on the program. Uh, She always current. She might be uh, in her elderly stage, but she seems to be... uh, on the know about things that are happening. Uh, She was even very up on what Kanye West was up to, Uh, but that'll be tomorrow. Uh, Tune in 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, right here. Uh, Our broadcast today, one of our listeners, uh, I try to 
be on the ball uh, when folks make recommendations. I know I haven't gotten everybody, but uh, we still are on, so we can perhaps take care of you, the rest of you all in the future. Uh, but one of our listeners uh, found the book that we're going to talk about today and thought it would be grand uh, to have the guest on the program, seeing as we talk about racial classifications, the concept of race all the time. Uh, it's a conversation that can be very confusing. Uh, we were just on Monday. I told you all to stay tuned uh, when we had our guests on talking about the documentary film uh, Behind the Black Curtain, uh, talking about racism in Orange County, California. And one of our guests, uh, she made the comment that we are hardwired to make racial classifications. And I said, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about that uh, later in the week. Uh, the audio clip that you heard at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., uh, he authored several books on racism, white supremacy. Uh, he has talked pretty consistently about the concept of race, uh, racial classifications, and how that promotes a lot of confusion. Uh, you can check out his work, uh, again, ProduceJustice.com. Uh, our guest for today's broadcast will be talking about her 2011 publication, The Nature of Race. Uh, really interesting text. Uh, looking forward to hearing her thoughts, her views on what this project was all about. Uh, she earned a PhD in 2004 from Princeton University. Uh, she is an associate professor of sociology at New York University. Uh, she worked as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and as a U.S. Foreign Service officer based in the American Embassy in Honduras. Uh, she gave all that up to do all this great work on race, demography, and the sociology of science. Uh, her work has been recognized by prizes, including the Dissertation Award from the American Sociological Association and a Fulbright Scholarship to spend the 2008-2009 academic year at the University of Milan. A uh, real pleasure to have her on the program. Know her schedule is busy with everything going a little bananas for the holidays. Thank you. She could share some of her afternoon with us. Joining us live, Professor Ann J. Morning. Professor Morning, are you with us? I am. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing some of your time. Pleasure to have you on the broadcast. Uh, for folks who would like more information, you can visit Professor Morning's website. The address is www.ann morning.com and that's Anne with two n's www.annmorning.com uh, Professor Morning for any of our listeners this might be their first time uh, hearing about you and your work uh, anything that you think would be helpful for listeners to know about you before we get started? <laughs> sure that's a great question so well let me tell you where my interest in studying how people think about race where that interest comes from so I'm a native New Yorker, I'm an African-American who grew up in Harlem, but as a kid, I, um, I had the opportunity to attend a school in Manhattan that was an international school, and so I had this kind of unusual experience of growing up in, a, in an African-American community, but then spending my days in a school with kids from all over the world, and, and you know, it didn't come up that often, but a lot of times I, I had questions from classmates, so from people not in the U.S., about the ways in which we Americans classified by race. Um, they couldn't understand, for example, why people with all shades of skin color, all kinds of different appearances, could all be lumped into one category, black, for example. So with those kinds of experiences, it really got me thinking about, you know, why it is that people in such different parts of the world seem to have such different ideas about what race is, um, and, and then I had, you know, various experiences, you know, as an, as an older person where I got to experience really in a very direct way, right, right up front, ways in which people would classify me that showed how different ideas were about race around the world. So, you know, like I said, I'm, you know, African-American. I, I grew up in Harlem in a black community. But, um, 
when I went, I had the chance to study in France as a young person. And when I would go there and people would ask me, what are you? And I'd say, well, I'm black. They would say, oh, no, you're not. You're, you know, you're mixed. You, you know, you should be in a different category. You know, we wouldn't classify you that way. We would classify you this way. Fine. Then, as you mentioned, thus I worked um, as a foreign service officer, so as a diplomat in the U.S. For, for the U.S. State Department, and I was posted in Honduras. And there, I got into uh, well an, an argument once with somebody, a Honduran person, who basically called me behind my back, who referred to me as a little mulatto, and and she told a, a Honduran colleague that. And when this Honduran colleague of mine told me what this person had said. You know, I was offended that somebody had said anything about my race, you know, in a work, in a government, you know, office space, like an embassy. And, you know, as an American, I thought that was completely inappropriate. But what my Honduran colleague thought was completely wrong was that she had called me mulatto instead of white. Because in, in her way of thinking, in my Honduran colleague's way of thinking, you know, I was an American with a, a powerful position in that country. And so, of course, my race should be white. And and so those kinds of experiences about how people have such, you know, just such different ideas about what races there are in the world, who belongs to what race, you know, what distinguishes one race from another, another that's really what got me on this, um, this journey of, of research that I'm doing now. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. The, uh, the person who made the comment uh, in Honduras mm-hmm. about you being the... Little mulatto, mulatto. Yeah. A little mulatto, yeah. It's a mulatilla, she said, for those of you who speak Spanish, yeah. Wow. Was this a, uh, someone who was classified, accepted as white or non-white? You know, that's an interesting question. She was, you know, probably like most Hondurans wouldn't, you know, especially not the, you know, elite Hondurans who, who are, you know, pretty light-skinned. But, you know, she's somebody who, let's say in this country, I don't think would be considered white. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. That sounds familiar. I feel like I could hear that (laughs) same insult happening in the States if they felt, oh, this uppity, high yellow uh, Mm -hmm. person trying to tell us. Does that sound kind of in the ballpark of what? Oh, I, you know, I think so. I think, first of all, I think that had this person who was upset with me, you know, had she thought I was, you know, white, completely white, she, you know, she would have never made some comments. She would have, wouldn't have said, oh, that little white, you know, employee said this to me. So, but what's actually, I forgot to add, but, um, when, uh, so my co-worker, co-worker went back to the woman who had called me a mulatto and said to her, you know, you really messed up because now she's mad at you and she's, she's not going to do the thing that you want her to do. And the, the woman says, um, she's like, oh no, but you know, I didn't mean anything by it. And in fact, I think she called me up and she said, you know, I, I didn't mean anything by that, you know, here in Honduras to say, call somebody a little mulatto is a term of it, affection and it, you know, it doesn't mean what it does, you know, to you Americans. And so, which is interesting because, on one hand, I think actually she actually she's right that in Latin America people will use color terms sometimes in a very affectionate way. I mean that they'll use color terms to talk about people in their own family with affection. But I think that even so, when that happens, those color terms are never completely free of the of the stereotypes and you know and the negative connotations that they that they had originally. So, mm, I would agree. <laughs> uh, I, particularly, I have seen the same pattern. We've had some guests who talked about racism in uh, Latin America, Brazil, and different areas. And uh, I still see the same pattern I see everywhere else where white is the good, black is the bad. That does not yeah. seem to deviate anywhere you happen to be that I know of in the known universe. Um, yep. Wow. For folks who, I guess you can go to the website, that would be one, uh, if you want to get uh, an image of Professor Morning, because I think that's important. If you go to the webpage or if you look online and see some of the photographs and what have you of Professor Morning, uh, you already said you're an African-American female. Uh, If one was to see you, they might say, hmm, she looks like she might have a white parent or they might have some some curiosity. Uh, Do you get that frequently when people see you? Right. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because it, it all depends on the context because so here in New York, where I'm from, people look at me and mainly think that I'm Latina from the Caribbean. So they'll look at me and think I'm Puerto Rican or I'm Dominican. And, you know, and that's because those are, are really big populations here in New York. And it's not surprising. I think in other parts of the country, 
um, people would be more likely just to read me as black. And certainly, you know, when I was growing up in Harlem, you know, there were plenty of other people around with, you know, all the shades of the rainbow. So, you know, in that, in an American, in an African-American neighborhood, nobody was surprised that I was there. Are either of your parents white? No, no. My parents are, my, I would say my ancestry is very much the the kind of classic African-American story of, of people who had some racial mixture that goes back to slavery. And so I don't, you know, in a sense, my family tree is like Michelle Obama's. You know, there's there's stuff in the family tree that happened during the era of slavery. Um, but certainly since then, everybody in my family has identified as, as black. I know. Uh, this program, we definitions, super important. Uh, what is your definition of racism? Mm, mm-hmm. So, you know, I would say that um, it's interesting that racism includes both negative thoughts or attitudes towards other groups that are based on stereotypes, and it also includes negative or hostile actions. So a lot of times people think that racism is just about what you think or say, you know, so we'll talk about racist ideas or racist words, and we don't, you know, we don't always realize that it's a, you know, a really wide range of things that goes everywhere from what's in your head to the things that you do. So I think it's important to have that, that broad definition about racism and also to understand that racism is about you know, acting, like I said, unfairly or negatively, and that can be anywhere from you know, impolitely to violently and fatally you know, towards people of another group. And your actions or your thoughts are motivated by or they're based on stereotypes, right? These... these um, you know, assumptions, these snap judgments that you have about what other people are like. Hmm. Do you think it's possible for non-white people to practice racism against white people? I think it's possible for non-white people to practice racism against white people. I think it's possible for non-white people to practice racism against other non-white people. And I think it's possible for people in any group to practice racism against their own group. So I think the, you know, the key there is that, you know, when, anytime you, you have basically the stereotypical image in your head about a group and you act in some way on that, then we're, we're, you know, we're talking about racism. I think one thing, though, that is important to understand is that it's one thing what individuals think and do, but it's another thing the way society is set up. So that, for example, I've been asked, you know, questions like, well, uh, if, uh, uh, like somebody actually, a journalist asked me the other day about a movie that I don't know if any of your listeners have seen. It came out a couple of years ago, but White Chicks, right, which involves um, <laughs> right, the Wayne brothers dressing up as white women, right, impersonating white women in this film. So it's interesting because it's like a reverse blackface. It's whiteface. But um, anyway, but, you know, this person asks, well, is that racism? You could say in a sense that, sure, they're playing on, on stereotypes about whites and particularly white women, for sure. But the fact is that if you're in a broader society where the backdrop is that racism is largely directed, you know, it's something that shields whites and harms other people, then, you know, a movie like White Chicks isn't, it's just not going to carry the kind of weight or be the kind of dangerous tool that the reverse would be. So while, yes, I think it's, it's possible for anybody to, to be racist, uh, you know, towards, you know, a, a pretty much any other group at, or, for that matter, their own, I think that it's important to keep in mind that some kinds of racism are much more deep, deeply anchored and therefore much more dangerous and much more destructive in their, in their impact. Hmm. Uh, I, I am familiar with that film. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate you giving the added uh, commentary on that film and why you felt like that. You know, you would not be so quick to jump and say, "Yes, this is an example of uh, black people being racist against white people." Can you give me an example that you think would illustrate non-white people practicing racism mm-hmm. against white people? Against white people. Well, you know, it's interesting. So let, let's take an example that, that people often use when they talk about racism, which is the idea of, you know, I, I wouldn't want my son or daughter to marry one, right? I, I, I wouldn't approve of interracial relationships um, for people in my family or, or whatever. You know, I, I think that that's a kind of racism which cuts both ways. 
Um, I don't, you know, I don't know off the top of my head if, let's say, black people are more likely to say that they're against interracial marriage than whites. In fact, I'm pretty sure that they're not as likely as whites to, to be opposed to interracial marriage. But, um, but you know, you could say that, you know, when somebody says, in fact, that's something my mother said to me when I was a, when I was a teenager, that she would be very disappointed if I married somebody white eventually. Um, you know, it, you know, arguably, you could say that's that's a kind of racism. It's based on a, a snap judgment about about people in another group. Hmm. That is fascinating. Um, wow, we. <laughs> I'm, I'm proce- like, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> I'm processing. Okay. Um, I, I mean, you know, we 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 could, I mean, we could go back and forth about whether it's really racism, whether you know, a comment like hers is is a justifiable one. I mean, and and I can tell you, in fact, what she what she said, what her reasoning was. She said, "Well, you know, I just feel like, um, you know, if you married somebody white, you would be throwing away everything your ancestors worked for, worked for, right? If you can imagine, I mean, that was pretty heavy to hear when I was fifteen or whatever it was. Wow. But you know." It, you know, the idea was that, you know, our our ancestors our ancestors suffered through slavery and they worked hard to get you to where you are now. So why should you take all the fruits of our labor that gave you the education you have and put the clothes on your back and the food on your table and all of that? Why should you, in a sense, take the benefits of all of that and and share that, you know, with, with somebody in the enemy camp? So. You know, so I, I don't know, you know, whether other people would think that is, you know, racist or not racist. But I think that, you know, any time you, you set down lines like that and rules about about how you treat people of another race or the relations you can have with other pe- people of another race, you know, I think that unfortunately you are dabbling in racism. Hmm. Okay. Wow, that is. Uh, I'm I'm glad you you gave the extra information. <laughs> yeah, give you the background. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, your mom that your mom shared with you. Um, wow, we in case mom is listening, thumbs up. That is grand. <laughs> that is grand. I uh, enjoy hearing that. Thumbs up to mom. Um, I guess my response, and this I think this is important because this will uh, give you more information uh, as we go through your book and, and kind of help grasp some of some of my thoughts when when I was reading your book, The Nature of Race. Uh, I, I'll start with my definition for racism, mm-hmm. my definition for racism. And I use racism and white supremacy mm-hmm. as synonyms. Uh, so okay. same definition, both terms. Okay. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Mm -hmm. That's my definition for Mm -hmm. racism. And uh, with my definition, my view, uh, I don't think it's possible for someone who is not white to practice racism uh, against white people, non-white people. I definitely think non-white people can mistreat white people, and that does happen frequently. Non-white people can obviously mistreat other non-white people as well. Uh, But I think with regards to racism, I don't see white people being stopped or having trouble getting jobs because black people, non-white people are making it difficult for them to get employment or to get housing or to get loans. I don't see that happening anywhere in the world. Uh, Even we've had guests from South Africa. We've had white and non-white guests from South Africa. And I don't even see that happening there uh, where Mm -hmm. white people are struggling to get constructive resources, help, things that they need to have a high quality of life, be it jobs, funding, education, whatever the case may be. Uh, If non-white people, and I do frequently, well, I can't even say frequently, (laughs) some time to time, I do hear non-white people who have hostile opinions or thoughts about white people, but in my view, that is not surprise. In fact, if anything, I'm surprised that I don't hear more of that, <laughs> given the long history of what white people have done to non-white people worldwide. Uh, it's, in my view, it is not surprising. That's not an act of racism. If if we were on a plantation, the people, the black people that are, have been enslaved, it would not be surprising 
if they had bad things to say about the white enslavers. That would mm-hmm. not be racism. That would be, in my view, that would be logical. That would be justified, even if they, even if those thoughts went to let's go kill all of the white enslavers. That would not be racism. That would be a response to the racism that has been acted out upon them. Uh, your mm-hmm. response to that? Am I sounding crazy? Mm-hmm. No, no. You know, well, what I was thinking is that I, so I agree with you that there's this close link between white supremacy and racism, but the way I would put it is that I see white supremacy as one brand of racism, and and I understand why you give it center stage, because it is, in a sense, it's the most important, it's the most consequential brand of racism that there is on the planet. I mean, it is the, it is the racism that is worldwide. Um, you know, uh, a hierarchy of color with, you know, the lightest at the top and the darkest at the bottom. We, I agree that we see that around the globe. And so, and so it's, you know, it is important to give it that prominence. But as I said before, I think that we have to also be aware of and open to the possibility that non-white people can be racist too, and they can be, in particular, racist, they can act in racist ways towards each other. So, for example, would you say that there's, you know, there's no such thing as racism between blacks and Latinos? You know, let's think of, you know, I I have a graduate student, for example, who's writing his dissertation on gangs in L.A., and he looks at conflicts between black and Mexican gangs. You know, I I think that we need to, to take into account, to factor into the bigger picture, the ways in which non-white people also, you know, have racisms that, you know, that have consequences. And for sure, the bigger backdrop is this wider hierarchical system of uh, of white supremacy that kind of colors, in a sense, everybody's racism. It's the backdrop that everybody has to navigate in. But honestly, I think that as the nation becomes more demographically diverse, and you guys are seeing that on the West Coast, you know, as much as we are on the East Coast, you know, whites are going to become, I mean, they're going to fall below 50% of the population within our lifetimes. I mean, that, you know, the, the current Census Bureau projections is that around 2040, that whites are going to become less than 50% of the population in this country. Uh, Latinos are going to be the next biggest group. They're going to be a lot bigger than they are now in terms of their, their population share. And so a lot of the interactions that people are going to be having, whether at school or the workplace or wherever in their churches, whatever it might be, are not going to be interactions which involve whites and non-whites. There's going to be a lot of interaction between people of color, and you know, and I don't think that racism is going to go away in those settings. Oh, I... I agree like 5,000 <laughs> okay. uh, I don't think the racism is going to go away and to go with where you started at uh, I, I think it's so important I, I think this is one portion I have failed I need to be doing this more white people are the minority on the planet right now uh, mm-hmm. they constitute less than 10 percent according to some reports that I've seen I've seen no more than 10 percent they are the minority right now and they have been for a long time and we still as you said the dominant form of racism in my view the only form of functional racism right now is white supremacy now what you said about in terms of conflict between individuals classified as Latinos individuals classified as black uh, absolutely, that is a problem, uh, and on the West Coast as well, not just in mm-hmm. New York. I bet. Uh, and even pro- in conflict between uh, different groups of Black people worldwide, mm-hmm. that is a major mm-hmm. problem. Uh, and I've heard also on the continent of Africa, we've talked about uh, potential conflict between individuals classified as Black, individuals classified as Chinese or Asian. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are serious problems that need to be thought about. However, I think all of that is within the context of white supremacy, which I think, as you said, colors, dictates, has a huge impact on how people are functioning with one another all over the world. And I think particularly with regards to black people, uh, who I think are the most, as you said, there is a hierarchy of race. I agree with that totally. White is on the top. Black is on the bottom. It gets worse for you. I think anywhere in the world, the darker you are, particularly if you carry the label black, your treatment is going to be way worse uh, anywhere in the world. And I think that is all white people are to blame for all of that. And so all of the the little conflicts that break out between other groups of people, everything, the way that it's set up, it's set up to produce those sorts of conflicts. But I think it's important to remember 
the people who are most to blame for all of this are white people. Uh, even when we talked about what happened with the uh, L.A. riots 20 years ago, where mm-hmm. you had conflict between black people and Korean shop owners, uh, even I heard on both sides, black people and Koreans eventually getting to the point of saying, wait a minute, white people set all of this up. They uh, put us here. They're the ones who didn't protect, didn't provide uh, police protection for the stores. They're the ones who had this crazy verdict in the first place where they beat up Rodney King. They're the ones who are to blame for all of this. But that got drowned out. And I think that's something I really try to be cautious about because I think that's something that helps keep the system of racism, white supremacy in power when the focus shifts from the problem is white people to well, we have other things, and we should be focused on Latinos or Asians or other black people. And da, da, da. Not that these aren't problems, but the source of all of these problems, I contend, white people, the global system of racism, white supremacy, if that makes sense. No, you know, it does. I mean, I think, so I, I think I would put it a little bit differently in that I would say that the, the root of the problem that we're talking about is, is European imperialism. You know, it was the, you know, the move, you know, people coming out of Europe to conquer people in, you know, every, everywhere they could get their hands on them in every corner of the globe. And that has left us with this, this devastating legacy that we're, we're talking about. But, and, and, you know, and I also appreciate what you're saying about, you know, we don't want to lose sight of that and, and start to act like, well, you know, this is just one of many problems or it's just, you know, natural that people don't get along or, you know, look, you know, Latinos are not treating blacks right or, or whatever. But, um, but at the same time, like I said, we have to, um, I feel like we need to have a more subtle take on the situation because in a sense, if, if we think that only whites are to blame or are the only people who are perpetrating racism today, then I don't think we're, we're really getting the situation because, unfortunately, the situation is not that cut and dry because, you know, as you know, what, what happens with that kind of racist system is that it infects everybody's ideas. And, I'll, you know, so that people who themselves would not be classified white as white end up you know, implementing, you know, policies or acting in ways that put down, you know, the people that they think are darker than them. So it, it, it's sort of like we, I think we, we don't want to forget, you know, what Franz Fanon wrote about ages ago um, with black skins, white masks, you know, all kinds of stuff. We want to understand how people's idea, people of color, their own ideas and thinking get infected by this and they in turn become part of the problem, can become part of the problem. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll give you um, an example. You said you've had guests from, from all over the world, so I don't know if you've had a guest from, from the Middle East, but I've been teaching in the last couple of years um, in, in sort of short stints in the United Arab Emirates, Emirates in the Persian Gulf. I've been teaching at NYU's campus in Abu Dhabi there. Cool. And that's, you know, that's a very interesting co- country because, you know, the people on top there are, you know, are the, the local Arab population. They're a really small minority of the country. They only make up about 15% of the people in that country. And basically the rest of the country is made up of the people that they import to, to do the work. Wow. A huge chunk of that, something like 65, 70% of the population is made up of poor people who come from South Asia, who come from India, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, to work and do, you know, all the hard labor there, the, you know, the construction work and so forth and so on. So that's a system where the people at the top, now, we, you know, we could talk about whether the, you know, the local elite, the, the Arab elite, should be considered white or not. Um, you know, my, my guess is that most Americans would not consider them white, let's put it that way, using our categories. But, you know, nonetheless, they, you know, they are busy, we could say, exploiting, you know, labor in, from, from South Asia. I mean, it's not like, you know, being a, a manual laborer working in 120 degree weather, you know, building buildings in Abu Dhabi is a, is a picnic. So, but all of that is happening against the backdrop of a larger system of, you know, of, of trade and, and, and investment where uh, it's a, a system ultimately, you know, that was set up by Europeans that, that it kind of reflects this old history of European colonialism and expansion and sort of reaching into all parts of the world. So that backdrop is there, but in a sense, you know, the, you don't need to have 
actual white people in place running the show for these hierarchies of color to to get set up and maintained. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree with that one thousand. Which, which, in my view, just shows how powerful the system is that you can have it rolling flawlessly, and white people don't even have to be present. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's right. I uh, want to make sure we get to the book as well and encourage folks that are listening in if you have any questions. Uh, she's so smart. Uh, <laughs> Professor Morning, uh, the number you can dial is 760-569-7676, and the code is 564-943-POUND. Uh, press star six if you have a question for Professor Ann J. Morning. Uh, your book, The Nature of Race, published in 2011, uh, what is this book about? What was your purpose for writing this text? Sure. So basically in this book, I wanted to understand how Americans were thinking about what race is. That is, you know, what, what do they think that racial groups are based on? That is, are we going around thinking about races as groups of people who share some biological characteristics, like, you know, are, are races supposed to be groups of people who have similar DNA, similar genes? Um, are we instead thinking about races as groups of people who just share a common culture? So they, you know, eat the same food and like the same music or speak the same language or, or what have you. Or I wanted to know if, or I wanted to know to what extent people might think about race in a, in a newer way, um, a way that sociologists certainly and other academics try to teach, I think with you know, limited success, but the idea of races as social inventions, and we, we often use the term, which probably some of your readers have heard, the term of race as a social construct, and all, you know, all that we mean by that is to say that what racial groups really are are groups that we've invented. So, you know, we have decided or made up our minds that there are such things as a white group and a black group and an Asian group and a Native American group or, you know, whatever it might be. And so I just, I wanted to see how, how people thought about what races were. And and the way that I did it was, or the the, the central question I, I used to get at this was to ask, well, what is it that, are, that people are learning in schools? So what are schools teaching us about race? And in particular, what are scientists, so the people who are supposed to be the experts, what are they teaching to young people about the nature of race, about what a race is, about what determines who belongs in which race, about where races come from, all of that. And so... So to do the study, I ended up, I interviewed professors uh, at four colleges in the Northeast. I focused on professors in anthropology and in biology because those are the the disciplines which historically have been the most involved in, in setting out to teach people about what races are. So, you know, those are the disciplines which have definitions like, you know, a race is, you know, such and such. So I focused on those disciplines when I interviewed professors I also interviewed undergraduate students on the same campuses because I wanted to find out what is it that the students were taking away in the classroom setting? What were they hearing? What what did they understand their teachers to mean when they talked about race in the classroom? And so, so I interviewed those students as well. And then finally, I also took a look at what high school textbooks were teaching students about race. So even before they set foot on a college campus, you know, what is it that you would learn from race if you, you know, went back to high school today and went through your textbooks and, and you know, studied earnestly whatever they have to say about race. Um, and I also, I wanted to look at high school textbooks too because, you know, as we know, going to college is a privilege. It's not something that everybody gets to do. Whereas high school, you know, the majority of the, the population gets to go to high school and goes through high school. So that's, you know, looking at high school textbooks was a way for me to get an idea of what the lessons about race are that most of us will get at, at some point or another. So that, that's how I set it up. Wow, okay. We're going to go through and read some of the sections, talk about it. I see we have listeners who have questions as well. Um, I guess before we, we get into the reading and what have you, I said I wanted to share um, my thought on race because that heavily influenced my reading of the book and, and processing uh, the research that you shared. Uh, as I said with my definition uh, for racism, racism, white supremacy, uh, they are synonyms. Uh, and I, I had a chuckle uh, as I was reading your, books, your book because I saw uh, several 
familiar names, uh, folks mm-hmm. who have been guests on the program. Uh, Daniel Kevlis, his work on oh, eugenics. Uh, Ian Honey Lopez, one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, five oh, thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> White he does great law. work. Woo! Fantastic, fantastic book. <laughs> Uh, and great program. You can hit the archives. And uh, Dorothy Roberts, also five-star, oh, yes. all-star yes. professor. I'm a huge fan. She's been on the program three times, great. Uh, particularly uh, when we had her on last, uh, 2011, in the fall. Uh, we started the program off at the very beginning, and she said that racism produces race. And she gave her mm-hmm. theory on that. She gave her explanation. And I told her, I said, for me, it's even simplified. And I try to make it mathematical because I think that can make it even easier for folks to grasp. For me, uh, my equation, uh, race, racism, white supremacy, they are equivalents. And mm-hmm. I almost took uh, the audio clip when we had Professor Ian Hani Lopez on the program. I took a paragraph from his book because I gave him, I told him that statement. We talked about it and uh, he was had slight disagreement, and I took mm-hmm. a passage from his book where he was talking about how race has evolved over time and who gets classified as white, and I substituted race. I took that out, and I put in white supremacy, and I think he had race about five times in the paragraph. I substituted white supremacy for race. I read it, and I said, I think it will be accurate, it'll make sense, and it'll be true to the original the original integrity of what you intended will be preserved if we substitute white supremacy. And he agreed, yes, that was the case. Um, my, my short, race, the only purpose for race is white supremacy. That is the only purpose it serves. There's no other use. There's no other benefit. And I contend pretty strongly, white people consciously and or subconsciously, they understand that. And I see so many parallels just to those two other terms with a lot of the same confusion uh, that you you talk about in your book and that you research where you have people who have all these different opinions and different views and you can go talk to five different people, five different uh, scientists or professors that are in the same department or the same field and you'll get five different uh, views or opinions on what race is, what it means, definition and all that. You see the same thing with racism in trying to get a definition what does it mean? How does it operate? You see the same thing. And I think that is a part of the confusion that is purposeful. Where non-white people, we get very confused about what racism means. We get very confused about what race means. And it's my contention, white people are not confused. Even if they don't have <laughs> the vocabulary to articulate, like they might not use the same words to articulate it that I am. They might not even have the vocabulary they understand what it means to be white. They understand the rubric of white is supposed to dominate. Everything else is whatever. Whatever it is, we're supposed to dominate. We're supposed to be in charge. White people do not get confused about that at all. And I think they even use it to their advantage. The confusion when people start to talk about race and what it means. Is it biological? Are we talking culture? That all works to their advantage when people get non-white people, I'm talking about, get confused about what that means. And I guess I would end uh, with things like on the census where you have all I can call it is malarkey like some other race. Uh, That was another one where I almost used that sound clip where they were talking about uh, they had a person at the Census Bureau and he was saying how they didn't intend for that category to become so popular and used. And now that's one of the most used categories on the census. Some other race and i mean that is that in my opinion can be nothing but malarkey and confusion to even have that as a legitimate category on the u.s census some other race as Mm -hmm. if that is supposed to be taken seriously Uh, i'll I'll get your response i just i thought that was important because that's what i that's what i had in mind while i was reading your book that's my view on on race racism your response Right. So you gave me a lot of stuff to respond to, a lot of food for thought. And I'm going to start actually with the, the last one, the, the census and the some other race category. So do, do you know why we have that category? Why it's still there? Because you're right, it's a, it's a lousy category, right? So, but do you know why we have it? Uh, I have heard one person from the Census Bureau give his explanation uh, as to why it's there, um, but I could be in error. And as a, you are very intelligent, so let's let's hear your view. Why is it? There? <laughs> okay. Well, wh- what I just wanted to point out is that it's because of a Latino elected official that some other race is a category on the census now, in the sense that it hasn't been taken off. That the Congress has gotten its hands tied 
by an advocate for the Latino community insisting that that category be there. The idea is that because the race categories now don't include a Hispanic or Latino category, and that, you know, a good, you know, if not most of those folks don't see themselves as either black or white, they don't think the labels black or white work for them well, you know, that they gravitate towards this some other race box. So I just wanted to, again, kind of just nuance a little bit this picture of, of how the increasing diversity in our own country is, is making it, I, I really think, harder to draw these stark lines between, you know, white supremacists do this and then, you know, everybody else pays the price or white supremacists on this side, blacks on the other. You know, the country is just, is just growing more and more diverse in ways that it's, it's, it's harder to draw those lines. Um, and we can certainly, you know, we can talk a bunch about the census. I, um, I'm on the national advisory committee that the census has on racial, ethnic, and other populations. So, and I, you know, have looked a lot at census classifications and their history. So, I would definitely be happy to come back to that. But, but I want to um, first address the thing that you started off talking about, and that is the relationship between white supremacy and the race concept in the first place. And, you know, I, I want to say that. I think probably most people who study racial categories and the history of racism, certainly in this country, I think would agree with you that the, this belief we have, this notion of race that we have, comes straight out of, you know, the European imperialist project that, you know, that, you know is white supremacy. So I think that's been very much the standard view, and most people subscribe to it, and I think it is, uh, you know, I think that is where our concept of race comes from. But I want to point you at the same time to some other scholars who are increasingly starting to argue that that the race idea that we have, that we inherited in a sense from our European colonial masters, that that idea is not unique and that other societies that have been imperial societies that have undergone colonial oppression, that they also develop their own homegrown notions of race. So their race ideas may not look like ours, but they come out of the same, the same kind of historical set of circumstances. That is, when you get situations with one group trying to oppress another, you get something, or, or trying to, to dominate or, or colonize another people, that you often get these, these ideas that look, you know, that have a family resemblance to our race idea. And, uh, and I'll give you an example from, um, from North Africa. There's a, a really interesting book written by a scholar named Bruce Hall, which um, it's called A History of Race in Muslim West Africa. And he dates it from 1600 to, to 1960. And anyway, his, what his argument is simply that, you know, that race ideas don't always or necessarily come from the European settlers, the European imperialists. He argues that in North Africa, where you had a different kind of imperialism, that, that is, you had an Islamic empire, so a Muslim imperialism that spread from the Arabian Peninsula in all directions. I mean, we're talking about a huge, vast, very powerful empire that made its way, as you know, into North Africa. That when that happened, you got in North Africa well before any, you know, Europeans set up and, you know, set up shop there. Um, you had a kind of local homegrown racism it, that even had color terms. It's interesting, they were kind of different. Apparently, in their sort of local race system, you had, I think it was the the red race and the black race. So there were, you know, some different color terms at work. But the idea was that basically the people on top were the Arab conquerors, or people who claimed that they were descended from Arab conquerors, and the local folks who had gotten conquered were, were on the bottom. So I want to just throw out this theory, um, you know, I don't know enough about it to, to judge, you know, which is the, the best theory to describe, you know, the history of racial thinking, but I think it's worth thinking about how race may get produced kind of in any, in any situation of conquest and imperialism, and certainly the Europeans were not the first people to conquer huge, you know, vast empires of, of people. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, they have been dominating uh, for some time. Uh, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. I think they, uh, I don't know of a spot on the planet that white people don't have the ultimate say-so about what's going to happen and dominating what's going on. Uh, I could be 
in error. Uh, we haven't had anybody who has strongly contested that and said, no, they don't think that's the case. Um, I guess a few white people, I would take that. A few white people, they have said they don't, they don't think that's the case. But uh, yeah, you can go back to the archives to hear that. I guess the, the quick point I would say with regards to the first uh, topic, the Latina, yeah. you said mm-hmm. a Latina individual who that's how the some other race got on the census? It's that, not so much how it got on, but there, there was a question of it coming off around the time of the last, the 2000 census, rather, and, and basically a Latino congressman insisted that it stay on. Okay. Um, I, I, get, I would say, number one, uh, I would go back in a system of white supremacy. I suspect white people were the people who were responsible for it being there in the first place, some other race. Uh, and I suspect that white people ultimately uh, had the decision about whether it was going to come down or not. Now, this uh, Latina individual making the suggestion uh, about that it should stay there, uh, but I su- that is a suggestion. Uh, I'm pretty sure the decision ultimately was in the hands of white people about whether it was going to be there or not. And uh, I do not use the term Latino, Latina. I don't use that term. I think that does promote some confusion. I've heard many folks who say, who said that Latino, Latina, that is someone who is from a Spanish-speaking area of the world. You can be white and Latina. I think that's also on the sentence. Uh, census. Mm-hmm, that's right. White and Latina. So you could have a white person. This could have been a white person who made this suggestion. You could have someone who looks like Dick Gregory, who is a black person, mm-hmm. and also be Latina. And in my view, that is promoting confusion. A lot of these individuals who are, uh, whether we're, they're using the term Hispanic or Latina, a lot of these individuals are accepted as white. A lot of these people, if you see them, they look Cameron Diaz, I would point. That would be one right there. <laughs> I think she's accepted as white. Now, she can say, I'm Latina. And I don't think anyone would say, oh, that's inaccurate or you're being disingenuous. But I think for the most part, someone who looks like her is going to be accepted as white. Uh, Same thing for Ted Cruz. I think he's accepted as a white person. Uh, So I don't use uh, that term. And I would say that even even if the person looked like Dick Gregory, let's say it was a a black person in Mexico who made the suggestion uh, that some other race should stay on the census. Uh, in my view, as I said, non-white people get very confused. Uh, in my, it's obvious the fact that the system is still here that non-white people have some confusion about what Europeans, white people have been and are continuing to do to us, or we would have solved this problem. We still wouldn't be complaining about racism. We would have taken care of this. So obviously, there has to be some confusion about what's being done, and I think a major part of it is right there with our understanding of racial classifications. If I and I'm, I'm confident that individuals who classify themselves as white, particularly the more powerful white people, they know this will work for us. We can put, a th- I think now you can check multiple boxes on the census. You don't even have to just pick one category. You can say that I'm white, uh, I'm some other race, I'm black. You can check a whole bunch of boxes. That's fine because, as I said, it comes back to white everything else. As long as white is in charge, and frequently on these documents, white is at the top that should not even be the case. If it was if it was going alphabetical, I would think African or Asian, African American, those categories would be at the top. For most of the forms that I've seen, white or Caucasian is the top choice, uh, which again is that hierarchy: white on the top, everything else. Yeah, you're just whatever. You can pick whatever you want. You can be twenty different racial classifications. You can be some other race. It just promotes confusion, and I think. White people increase as what you continue to say, as more as this country becomes, quote unquote, more diverse, you have more po- a larger population of non-whites in this area of the world, a decreasing population of white people. I think there'll be more of that. I wouldn't be surprised if you end up with 20, 30 more racial classifications on the census. Uh, and in my view, that is not going towards solving the problem of racism. That is just exacerbating confusion and then you'll end up even having more conflict I suspect between these different groups of individuals uh, saying well this should be a race this should be as they add more and more categories I think even uh, within the last 20 years there was a lot of talk about uh, individuals who have a white parent and a non-white parent saying that multiracial that should be a category or biracial or whichever term is in vogue that that should be a different separate racial classification, all of that, as I said, I think it just it benefits confusion. It helps the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, I wrote down the, the title, uh, Bruce Hall, A History of Race oh, yeah. in Muslim West Africa. I want to see mm-hmm. if we can get him on uh, the program yeah. as well, because I think that would be great to 
discuss. Uh, I'm pretty certain uh, happening on the continent of Africa, and you said that they had color terms associated, red. Yeah, that, that's what he found. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Were the black people in charge? No. The, so the people who were the conquerors who would come, who basically Arabs. Hmm. That still doesn't sound like we've deviated very much from what the standard is from what I observed. But I, as you said, I'm not, I am nowhere near uh, super informed or knowledgeable about that, but I definitely, I will be looking to get that book and seeing if we can chat it up with him to get more information about that. I think that would be great to learn more. Um, yeah. I want to read a little bit from your book. I see the questions, so I'll read a little bit and then I'll pause so I can get a couple of the folks that dialed in oh. with questions. You know, could I could I trouble you guys? So yeah. could, could I ask you a question to, sure, to sure, stay sure. on the census sure. topic another minute? Because sure. I actually, I want to ask you something to understand better your argument. So are you saying that you feel that having racial classifications on the census at all is the problem, that it that it furthers white supremacy, or is it the number of categories, the proliferation of categories that is the problem, that that supports white supremacy. I just I want to understand what you're what you're arguing. I think it would be most accurate and I think it would be most helpful towards solving the problem of racism. And I, I could even give an anecdote to help with my response. Okay. There was a white enforcement officer uh, here in Washington State. I was on the campus of uh, University of Washington, Seattle. We had been talking about racism publicly, and he stopped to see what we were. It was a group of us, and he stopped to talk with us for a while. And from that point forward, like he would stop anytime he saw me, he would stop and we would talk about racism. Mm -hmm. So he comes to the library one day. I think somebody had something got stolen. So he comes to the library to investigate this theft, and he makes a joke because I'm a black person. He says, Oh, did you steal it? Ha ha ha. And so we keep talking, and he says, uh, when, uh, when we arrest people or we do the form or what have you, we have to mark down race. And I said, of course, with system of race, what do you expect? And so he says, uh, how would you want to be identified on the form? What, what, would, you, what would you check? Black, African-American? Like, what would, what would you want it to say? And I said, victim of white supremacy. And he said, what? That is crazy. I don't want, that's, that's not even a category. Come on now, tell it. What, what, would you, what category would you want? And I said, victim of white supremacy. I think that would be most accurate. If we can't have that, it should be non-white. If the census came out and it said white, not white, oh man, I would be ecstatic. Now we are getting to clarity. Now we're going to have a lot less confusion. We're going to get a lot more people, non-white, and I want to continue to emphasize that. It is not white people that are confused. White people are very clear about this. Even 18-year-olds, I suspect 15-year-olds, 10-year-olds, they are not confused about this at all. They understand. They do not need... 20 minutes to fill out the census form to figure out their racial classification and my son on the race, my aunt has uh, Cherokee or I think my dad might have uh, got a little bit of Irish and all. They check white and keep rolling. If they are not confused at all, non-white people would start to be a lot more clear about what the problem is, who's causing the problem if the census form said white, not white, and that's it. There were no other boxes, no other categories. We would begin to throw away that whole concept because, again, I'm saying the whole purpose for this concept of race and these racial classifications is to promote practice racism, white supremacy. When we start, if those classifications started being thrown away, man, we would be making major progress. And I think I'll end by saying I think if you look at the history of the census and the racial classifications, it's been the exact opposite. It started with, I think, like three, a very small number, and it's just proliferated. And it looks like it's not shrinking anytime soon. If anything, they're just going to be adding more. It's going the exact opposite direction of what I think it should be. It should be going reverse, white, not white. And that's it. Does that, does that but, make you know, sense? I, no, I, I'm going to take issue with you here because if we were to look historically, I mean, if we look at the first census, so the first census in 1790, so, of course, being the kind of country that we were, even at the very beginning of the founding of the country, we had a census that already used race terms. So, you know, that was a census where you just, you had white. You know, that was it. And either you were white or you were slaved, and, you know, nobody cared. It, you know, it doesn't get any simpler than that. You know, eventually they added colored as a term. They started to mention Indians. But, I mean, we used to have a lot fewer racial categories, but we were a slave society. So I, I don't see the relationship between, the you know, going for a white, non-white dichotomy, and that somehow means we're in a better place in terms of, you know, doing away with racism. And I'll also give you 
and I mean, I, I want to agree with you, though, that, you know, for most of the nation's history, those categories on the census were being used to to harm non-white people. I think there's no question about that. I mean, the reason that we had those categories on the very first census is precisely because, you know, we had decided that only white people would have the benefit of, of full citizenship. You know, they would be the only ones who would have all the rights that came with with citizenship, of course. So dividing people by race, counting people by race, counting whether they were white or something else was just a way of knowing who has full rights in this country, who's fully invested, and who is not. And so absolutely, the, you know, we have the categories. They originated out of a, a, out of a white supremacist society, no question about it. But in the 1960s, with the civil rights movement and the aftermath, we started to use these categories for a very different purpose. And the reason that they are on the census now as I'm, you know, I'm sure you know, is because they are being used to collect data about people of different racial groups as a way to monitor the discrimination they face, to, to track the extent to which they, they get access to all the same things as any other Americans do. So, you know, the Census Bureau collects that data about race to, for example, to support the work of the Equal Opportunity Commission to see, you know, are there you know, as many black professors in New York City as, you know, as we would expect given their share in the population? Does it look like, uh, you know, Latino radio hosts are not, you know, getting in on the industry as easily as people of other backgrounds, whatever it might be? So the categories that the categories are on the census today as part of a civil rights initiative to to fight discrimination and it's it's a weird thing because it's like our country had to do a complete 180 or try to do a complete 180 to take these categories that were absolutely racist in their origins and try to use them for something positive but i'll, I'll close with one last example that also you know makes me question your idea that you know we would just be better off if we had you know only if you know white non-white categories or no categories at all in the census so France is a country where they don't have any race or ethnic categories on the census. It's it's illegal and just socially rejected. You know, they feel there that, I think kind of like you're arguing that it would be, you know, a horribly dangerous and pernicious thing to do to introduce these kinds of categories on the census. They feel strongly that... You know their, uh, you know their kind of national political model means that you know everybody is a citizen. It shouldn't matter what your your color is. You're all equal before the law, and so you know let's not use these kinds of categories in the conduct of our official business. But you know, in reality, on the ground, what happens? You know, they have racism, right? Because they're you know right at the at the heart of the white supremacist system that we've been talking about, right? I mean, the French had a huge empire, as you know, in West Africa, and North Africa, and Southeast Asia. I mean, the Caribbean, they're all over, the, West Africa, they're all over the place in the world, certainly spreading, you know, the most, you know, hardcore white supremacist values of any European colonial power. And so, not surprisingly, it's also a country today where you have racism. But what happens when you don't have any racial categories on the census to try to measure the impact of that racism? Right now, you know, we know kind of anecdotally or by eyeballing the situation that, you know, people of North African descent are disproportionately represented in the prison system in France. They are completely underrepresented in, in education in higher education especially, you know, in the workforce at the upper levels. I mean, it, it is clear that race matters in a serious way in France, but without any kinds of categories on the census that would let you measure, you know, look, the average income of people of North African descent is this compared to the average, you know, income of people of, you know, French European descent is that. Nobody has the statistics, the numbers to try to make, to, to prove that 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 racial discrimination is going on, and then to try to develop programs to, you know, to try to get at that. So I'm not, you know, I'm more, um, I don't think that taking the, the racial categories off the census would necessarily put us in a better place. Hmm. I might not have been uh, as clear as I could have been. I don't think removing the, cat. I don't, and it's not taking them all off, white, mm -hmm. non-white, it would be a drastic reduction in the number of categories. I don't think that would eliminate racism. I don't even think it would reduce racism. 
uh, I think, or at least my goal with it would be to reduce the confusion mm. amongst non-white people. Uh, again, as I said, I think the racial classifications generate a lot of confusion amongst non-white people. I think it would produce a lot more clarity for us with regards to what is happening. And even going to what you said at the beginning about early on in this country, they had white slave or yeah. Negro, what have you, uh, on the census. I mean, it does not get any clearer about what is happening than back at that time, white, non, and particularly what it means to be not white. I think there was a lot more clarity. I could be incorrect, but I think there was a lot more clarity on the part of non-white people, black people specifically in this area of the world, what it meant to be white, what your status is. I don't think you had as much confusion uh, at that time about what the problem is, what we were dealing with this, uh, with regards to black people, non-white people in this area of the world. That's that's what I'm hoping would be the mm-hmm. case if we didn't have some other race and all these goofy categories. I mean, even in my opinion, having to spend time talking about some other race as a category, multiracial as a category, biracial as a category is just it's generating oodles and oodles of more confusion. And it's taking away time and energy that could be better spent, I think, focused on what are we going to do to solve this problem, improving our quality of life and ultimately neutralizing this system, which you call European uh, colonialism, European empire, system of racism, white supremacy. I could be an error. I definitely uh, don't think that just taking the categories away would end uh, racism. That is crazy. <laughs> I think, but uh, you know what? I think that, I mean, it's it's interesting because, so let's say we, we do what you say and we, we move to just a white, non-white, you know, binary on the census. So that would be like saying, you know, we think that people who are of African descent and Asian descent and Latin American origin and Native American descent are kind of, you know, they, they all face the same circumstances in the U.S. Like, we, we don't need to know whether, you know, black people are more likely to be, you know, targeted by workplace discrimination than are Hispanic people or Asian people. I mean, if you if you collapse all the categories in that way, if you lump everybody together in that way, then that's basically what you're doing. And, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is that you think that would be okay, that the important thing is to understand that, you know, either you're white or you're not, and that's all that matters. But if if we look at the data that we have now, you know, there are some really considerable differences between how well off, let's say, people are, you know, in different pockets of this non-white population. So, you know, if we were to look at people, you know, people of South Asian descent, right, in this country, they, you know, on average, you know, are doing much better economically than, let's say, people of Mexican descent, for example, and, you know, if we just put a- all of those folks together in a non-white category, I'm not sure we would really be getting the the picture, the detailed picture of what's going on in the society that we'd want to know about. That and I agree uh, completely. Not a, not everyone in the non-white category is treated the same. That's something I have yeah. uh, pr- uh, talked about consistently on the broadcast. I think I said earlier today, I think individuals classified as black uh, you're going to be treated way worse. Uh, we even have talked about that in, in greater detail. We've had individuals who are classified as Asian on the program and saying that they, even some of them have admitted bluntly, they know they are not treated as worse as black people and, and going into detail. I agree with that. It's just, I think, number one, the people who control this information, I'm of the opinion, white people uh, ultimately are the ones who are controlling this information. Uh, I think, as you said, this has been since the 60s where mm-hmm. there was an effort to get Uh, more classifications and to try to use this data to see, well, hey, black people are not making inroads uh, with Mm -hmm. regards to housing or employment in this particular region or in these particular fields. Uh, A lot of these problems still exist and in many cases are getting worse in some areas. Mm -hmm. I think we've had enough time to see that white people are not going to stop practicing racism just on the basis of getting this information that black people in Hoboken, New Jersey are not getting housing or Asians uh, in a certain segment of Los Angeles are not doing well in a certain uh, employment area of employment. White people are not going to necessarily rectify or change their behavior. I haven't seen any evidence that that's going to happen. It again, not going to stop racism, but just going with the confusion, uh, I think. And I could be an error, but I do think it would make 
a big impact with regards to the confusion on the part of non-white people with their understanding of what's happening and who's in charge. With it, if it was just very clear, white, non-white on the census, I could be in error, and I know mm-hmm. I'm sure some many folks would say, "Oh, I don't think so. I don't agree." Or they they have some sort of useful uh, useful data or useful information that could be the case. But I just uh, And I would also add, too, with some other race and Latina and all that, I suspect that we're not getting an accurate depiction even now with all of those categories because I strongly suspect there are individuals who are perhaps checking the Latina box or some other race who, when you see them visually, they just look like a white person. And so they're checking all these boxes or what have you. So I suspect even now you're probably getting a lot of inaccurate information based on these statistics because i mean that's i don't know how it could be accurate with some other race uh and who's checking that what does that really mean and who all is going to be piled in that so i suspect that there's a lot of inaccuracy with regards to what those results look like anyway and uh, i would just end again white people are in charge of collecting disseminating uh this data how it's going to be used if you have access to it so i would I would have a lot of question marks around that regardless just because of who's controlling the uh, the collection and dissemination of that information. Uh, well, you, you know, right, that the, the chief of racial statistics for the U.S. Census Bureau is a, is a man of color, right? Well, I mean, An African-American man. You should bring him on. And the guy who heads the, the uh, ethnic statistics division is Hispanic. I mean... You know, I mean, we can talk about the larger structures and all of that, but those might be some interesting people also for you to talk to. Um, and I, and the, but I want to come to this more basic point that you're saying, you know, is the information even any good that, you know, that we are getting with these categories the way they are now? And I agree with you that they, they're they certainly messy, the data, and, and hard to interpret, but I don't think it's so much because there's somehow there's the right answers somewhere and we're just not getting the right answers. The thing is that when we're talking about race and we're talking about racial classifications, we are fundamentally talking about invented categories, right? And we can actually take the example of Hispanics, right? The idea, you know, we're we're probably used to us, uh, I mean, many of us are used to the idea now that there is, you know, a big group of people in the United States called Hispanics, or Latinos, preparing them people's preferences of, of the language. Um, but, you know, that idea of a group, a Hispanic group, is really a pretty recent idea. Nobody really had that idea or that label until the 1970s. Because before then, what you had was you had some people of Mexican descent in the Southwest, mainly. You had some people of Dominican and Cuban and Puerto Rican descent in the East, on the East Coast. And nobody was really thinking that those folks had something in common altogether, that they should be in one big group altogether. And so the idea that those, that kind of hodgepodge of people from different places with different, you know, origins and cultures and all of that, that they somehow belong in one group, one racial kind of group together is a new idea. It's an invented idea. And we could look at any of the racial categories that that we have and see the same process where, you know, the term gets used and then there's some debate about who really belongs in there. You know, when it comes to whites, as you probably know, for a long time, people felt that Italians shouldn't be there, Jews shouldn't be there. Some people still feel that way. Um, You know, the Irish didn't belong there. All kinds of people you know, supposedly weren't really white and didn't belong in that category. And today, you know, we have, I would say, the same question when we think about people from the Middle East or North Africa. Should they be in the white category? Should they not be in the white category? People from India used to be in the white category. Now they're in the Asian category. So all of these these categories are moving targets, and of course they are because we invented them. So I think we have to try to get rid of the idea that they're somehow correct real answers out there for us to get, and instead, what the Census Bureau has to do is something even harder, which is to which is to try to get the pulse of what people believe the races are, and then kind of try to use categories that match people's beliefs about difference, or at least you know the categories that seem real to people, and then try to use those categories and and those data to get some feel for inequality in society, you know, in our society. So it's a really it's it's a messy process inherently. I, I designed to be that way, uh, in my opinion, uh, to promote confusion. I, I could be wrong. I want I want to go ahead and get a few callers because uh, I suspect they might have a thought or two. 
Um, the one quick thing I was going to say, because you mentioned uh, that some of the uh, individuals, at least who have titles, that they are in charge or very high up at the Census Bureau or non-white. Uh, mm-hmm. President Obama is definitely Yeah, that's not right. Remember him? White. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Eric Holder, also definitely <laughs> not white. Uh, I would still contend white people are in charge, ultimately, of what's going to happen in this area of the world. President Obama notwithstanding, Attorney General Eric Holder notwithstanding, or any other non-white people who ha- might have titles, positions, uh, as though they have some authority. Uh, They do not, even President Obama, even Attorney General Eric Holder, they do not dictate to white people what is going to happen. Uh, And that's just flat statement. I could be in error. Uh, If I don't think that's the case with them, I would certainly say anybody else, wherever they happen to be, Census Bureau, uh, whatever other departments, uh, they certainly are not dictating to white people what's going to happen. It's the other way around. And I suspect that's Worldwide, white people are the ones who are dictating what's going to happen under a system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, and just quickly, uh, you were saying the the we. That was the point I was going to bring up in the book. Uh-huh. That's something I try to watch. Um, it's I don't say we with regards to in constructing racial classifications. I think you were talking about uh, mm-hmm. the, the category mm-hmm. of Hispanic. I don't say we. That is white people because I'm I am a black male. I'm quite sure that black people did not play a part in constructing Hispanic as a racial classification, particularly one that's going to be placed on the sentence, uh, the census uh, and saying that this is a group of people. Uh, we're going to classify them together and put them down and say that they have something in common or that they should be looked at as a group with a culture or whatever, however people are perceiving and thinking of quote unquote Hispanic as a racial or ethnic classification or Latino or whatever uh, term that people are going to be using. Uh, I I make sure to say that this is white people. This is not we. I think sometimes uh, that is a tendency I've noted uh, with guests and other people that we've talked to to kind of make this an all inclusive. Everybody participated in this. And I just don't think that's the case, particularly when we're talking about racism uh, and things directly, indirectly that are related to the practice of racism on the planet. The vast majority of the time, the driving force, it is white people. Not, And it certainly would not be every single white person, but it would be white people in a decision making capacity uh, with the authority to decide this is going to be done. This is not going to be done. Hispanic is now going to be a racial classification. Does that does that make sense or no? You know, I know I, I take your point definitely that um, if, in a sense, you know, you're talking about you're talking about institutions that when you're talking about white supremacy, you're really talking about institutions that outlive and are much broader than any individual. And, you know, so you're right when you say, well, it's true we have President Obama, but that doesn't mean that white supremacy is gone. You're, you're right, because there are institutions in place that, in a sense, nobody, honestly, no individual controls in any simple kind of way. But I think that's why when you, for me, when you say white people, I think it's more accurate and less confusing if you, you know, talk about, institutions, so supremacist institutions, things that are in place, rules, customs, things that are have gotten bigger than, than any individual. And, you know, think of, you know, something like a custom, and an institution like the one-drop rule. You know, we, and here I mean the African-American we, we are partly the gatekeepers of that rule now. It's true that we didn't invent the one-drop rule, but now we're as just as likely as white people to, to use that kind of thinking to define who is in or out of the, the community. But that's a, you know, that's a way of categorizing people that came out of racism, um, well, out of slavery and racism. So, I don't know, I, I think that, you know what I, I worry about, I guess, a little bit, Gus, is when you say white people are responsible for this, they're responsible for that, it, I feel like it actually might be a little bit harder for people to wrap their minds around because they're looking for the person, the white man who dictated this or that or the other. And you want to get across the idea that we're talking about traditions and customs and mindsets and rules and and institutions and organizations and everything that is set up in a certain way that that favors whites. But it's not, it's hard to point to that as a work of, uh, you know, a person or some, you know, cabal of of people. do you know what I mean? Ab- absolutely. I do understand, as I said, uh, Professor Ann J. Morning, very intelligent, uh, just enjoying the conversation. But I deliberately say white people because I think that is one of the ways that 
number one, we don't get honest dialogue about what's happening. Uh, and I also think that that's one of the ways that white, particularly the white people who are in the so-called anti-racist industry. I'm talking about individuals like uh, Timothy Wise, admitted mm-hmm. racist. He's been on the program. Uh, Dr. Peggy McIntosh, uh, she's been on the program, Invisible Knapsack. Some of these other people in this industry, they talk about institutional racism. Uh, mm-hmm. And they will say exactly what you just said. We're talking about codes, customs, laws, rules, things that have been in place for many, many years uh, with regards to how you govern, control, and treat people. All of that is true, but for me, it misses one astronomically important variable. Regardless of the rules, customs, laws, none of that works if you do not have people in place to carry out those rules. And generally, it's got to be white people who are in place, not only to carry out those rules, laws, customs, but to refine them. These rules haven't been the same uh, throughout the history of white supremacy. They change. They morph. They take on different forms. At one point, not that long ago, white people had signs up dictating how racism, white supremacy was going to operate. No niggers here. No niggers there. They changed the system and operated in a different manner. That didn't just happen mystically. Uh, And I think, at least for me, that is very problematic to talk about racism, white supremacy in that way, as though these things just happen. They're just codes or laws in place that just mystically, these things happen, they take place, and the system just keeps rolling. No, generally, you can often, if you look, you can find a name and a specific white person or a group of white people who did these things, who wrote these laws, who put these rules in place, and specific white people who enforce these laws to make sure these things happen. That does not happen most of the time in discussions on racism where we put names and faces on how these things happen. And I think that's another big part of the problem with regards to understanding when we're talking about racism, we're not talking about something that's nebulous, uh, that is mystical or magical. We're talking about a problem amongst people created by people who happen to classify themselves as white. Many of these people are walking around right now, every day, Tom, Jane, Mary, many of these people right now at the PTA, at the school board, they are responsible for things like stand your ground. This is not mystical. This did not just happen. uh, Hocus pocus. There's specific white people that can be named uh, and located who have a physical address who get up and eat breakfast in the morning, have a Mm -hmm. glass of orange juice that are responsible for how things like this happen. And I don't think there are enough conversations about racism that happen in that manner where it's just, hey, this is a problem with white people, white people doing things, saying things, using words, laws that allow for really that plan for the abuse of non-white people, particularly black people, if that makes sense. It does. I I totally agree with you that we shouldn't use talk about institutions or whatever to let people off the hook or to not not shine light on on the perpetrators that we know are are out there. So I I agree with you on that. Uh, I'm hitting the callers, hitting going straight down the list. Uh, Folks can... uh, Get your questions ready. Uh, I'll give out the number one more time. 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you have a question. Uh, The person that called in from a blocked number, did you have a question for Professor Ann J. Morning? Oh, greetings to you, Gus. Am I being heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, greetings to you, Gus, and greetings to Professor Morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to. Um, you're welcome. I'm going to make a quick statement and then I'm going to ask a question. Uh, you, um, on your opening dialogue, you mentioned about other societies who also have a racial hierarchy mm-hmm. in how they categorize people, and I would have to give a pushback on that and say I totally disagree because in most homogeneous or homogeneous society that where the people are all the same, like for instance like Japan or China, you don't have that situation because they all look the same. They're all basically Japanese. They might differentiate in all religion or religious philosophy as to what it is that they worship, but they're all basically the same. So you don't have that dynamic of race as you do in the Western society. The same thing with the color coding or the color category that it has over here 
where they want to put white and they want to break down all of these different categories as to non-white and Latinos and all of this, it's because people who call themselves white know that they're in a minority position, and if they keep breaking down all of these other majority people who are black or, or whatever other, other ethnic groups, if they keep breaking them down further and further and further down, then they could remain in a dominant position, especially in places like the United States, where they are projected to go into minority status, so that all of a sudden we have to shuffle the deck, we have to start creating all of these new categories and put people into them so that whites can remain in a dominant post. Now, you were stating that, for instance, that you believe that black people can be also racist within groups and also towards white people. And I also have to agree with you, there's a difference between bias and prejudice. Because we all are supposed to be prejudiced. The human body is prejudiced. We have, because in order, if we were not prejudicial in the human body, viruses would be able to come in and take it over and kill us all. So if the human body can practice that form of discrimination and prejudice to make sure it stay alive, there is nothing wrong in being prejudicial. So when you take it to an extreme level, as people who call themselves white have done, especially the people who are black, is when it becomes a problem. So if you can tell me, what, give me one instance where someone black has practiced racism against someone white, I would appreciate it because this is something that was very troubling to me when you mentioned it, that we can also be in that form towards a white person. Okay. So let me say, okay, I'll, I'll just address that question. So in my view, so this has to do with my definition of racism, which is, you know, different, different than Gus's, and so you might not agree with it, but in my view we're talking about racism anytime we're talking about people acting on stereotypes that they have about another group, you know, acting in a negative manner toward, towards another group because of stereotypes or blanket assumptions that they have about that group as a race, so that there's something about that race that has some undesirable quality. And I think that blacks absolutely, you know, can have undesirable or whatever, negative prejudices, negative stereotypes towards other people. They could be white people. They could be uh, people of Latino origin. They could be Asian. But I think that there's no, I mean, it's no stretch of the imagine, imagination, especially just, you know, taking what we know about what people say about, like I mentioned before, interracial marriages, right? We know that people, you know, in many different groups have, uh, have an opposition to that. And they'll say because of the negative impressions that they have about people in that group, even if they don't actually know many people in that group. They have ideas about what people in that group are like. And whites are not the only people that have those kinds of stereotypes about people in other races. So that's, you know, in my view, that would count as racism. But, it, you know, it might not in yours. Okay. Um, if I can sure. um, go, back at, go back to that question. We, we all have biases and prejudices because prejudice means to prejudge without knowing. That's what rate of suffix came mm -hmm. from. So for me to have a bias or a prejudice against someone who is white or a Latino or whatever, some of it could come from past experience and some of it could come from media-driven that's put out mm -hmm. here that we all run with. Mm -hmm. But... It comes with action. What I can say, I can say I, I don't like white people, I hate Latinos, I hate Asians, I hate whatever it is. Me, I can get on the soapbox and do it all day long, as, deep, as people do in New York where they have these different street corner people get up there and they say all these things that they want to say. But it comes with action. White people have actions behind their words. They can put actions into play where someone could come and knock on my door, drag me out, put me into greater confinement, they can restrict my employment. I could get fired. I could get all my letter in the mail saying, you know what, you no longer need your services. Those are actions that come behind whatever it is that they think of me. I don't have that um, power and authority over anyone else. I can't restrict them from living, going to school, or doing any of those things. So unless you have power behind your actions, then you are just blowing off steam. You know, I, I, ag I, I agree with you. you. You know, I agree with you that... Action is part of the equation, and 
you know, and blacks and other people can also take actions. They can, you know, refuse people jobs in their businesses or, you know, black professors cannot grade, you know, students of other races as fairly as they might, for example, to take an example from my line of work. But so, uh, so in my view, what's important there, what constitutes the racism is when you are taking an action, you're doing something, you're refusing somebody something or not giving them an opportunity, whatever it might be, on the basis of race. But having said that, so I, I guess I don't quite agree with you, but where I do agree with you is that the bottom line, what's important is the power that you have to put behind that action. So, so my view is that blacks, Asians, Latinos can be racist towards other groups, and, you know, we know from surveys, you know, people in non-white groups do demonstrate racial um, prejudices. Um, some do. But I agree with you that not everybody has the same power, the same status in society to make those racist actions count, to make them stick, to make them have consequences for people. So on, on that score, I, I absolutely agree with you. Okay, I'll say this one thing, Gus, and then I'll get off and let someone else get a chance. As you were saying with the power dynamics when it comes to the grading of papers. because Yeah, for example. In, I'm also in academia myself. Mm -hmm. If I were to take out my dislike on someone and grade their paper incorrectly or give them a wrong answer, they have evidence to back up to show everything that they have, and they could also take it to someone else higher up above me to say, okay, I believe she doesn't like me. If we have had run-ins in the class. I have witnesses to show that th these are the dynamics that went on between us. I would like to do an independent review, go back through, and see if I was graded incorrectly. That can be corrected. I'll be out of a job. In, in, the, in the situation, um, so there is still that power dynamics whereby I can do petty, stupid things if I so choose, but I, it will be at my own cost. The white, white people have an institution behind them that pushes them, and most people don't want to go up against them because they are afraid of the crush that comes with it, the might and the power that comes with it. So we need to differentiate between being prejudiced, a bias, and also being racist, because when we say racism, it involves systems. Black people don't control any systems. We, could, we, don't, we, we, might, we don't even control our mouth. We run up at the mouth all the time. <laughs> But we don't control any systems because there's always someone else above us who don't look like us who can come in at any given moment and put us in check to let us know, no, you, we have this, we, we're going to correct this, that you, this mistake or this, or this error that you made. And thanks, Gus, for the program. It's most informative, and I'll let someone else get a chance to get in. Thank you. Well, You're so welcome, Professor. Uh, when you all were talking, it reminded me the incident we were talking about this past weekend in uh, Minneapolis. I'm going to the next call. I just it reminded me uh, the uh, non-white instructor in Minneapolis, uh, biracial instructor at the racially diverse Minneapolis Community and Technical College, has been reprimanded for the way she made three white students feel in class. The students complained of racial ha uh, harassment during Shannon Gibney's intro to mass communications class. Part of her curriculum included a lesson on structural racism. When the male students, white male students, complained about Gibney's tone, the school leaders sided with the students and reprimanded her. Uh, any black, non-white people who are in the classroom, academic setting, uh, if you think you can mistreat your white students, grade them incorrectly, or do something to quote unquote practice racism against them uh, my two words would be try it uh, the person that dialed in 8917 you had a question for Professor Ann J. Morning your line should be open hello yes ma'am hello yes, oh, hi Professor Morning hi hi um, uh, did I and hello to you Gus and the other callers uh, and listeners, um, did I hear Gus say that you were in the Foreign Service? Yes, I used to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. May I ask where you served overseas? What were some of yeah. your overseas assignments? I served in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and I served at the, uh -huh. United, and at the United Nations, so at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. Yes, yes, okay. Oh, no, I only ask because I'm also in the Foreign Service, so it's oh, always okay. great to uh, where, where, you know, where have you listen? served, if I can ask? 
Uh, I've served in China, uh, Chengdu, and mm -hmm. I've also served in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh huh. Uh huh. And. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm, I'm present. I don't know. What, I don't want to say where I'm serving now, but I'm sure. presently in the Middle East. Got it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So, okay. but anyway, I just, I just wanted to just say that. Um, okay. So your present research is all uh, has to do with how scientists determine race and how that's transmitted, you know, in textbooks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. is that so correct? that's yeah. That's what I wrote about in my book. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I just want to say, though, I, I believe just in my domestic experience, um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and also just in my world travels, I, just based on my experience, and, and I am a, 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 a Nubian, person of Nubian heritage or, or so-called African-American, um, and my phenotype is uh, I'm, I'm a dark skin young lady, and um, in my experience, it's race is based on phenotype. So if someone looks at you, they, you know, and they see your coloring or they see your, your hair texture or maybe eye shape um, or, you know, the size of your lips or whatever, they're going to make a determination, you know, on uh, what your race is based on, you know, your phenotype. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think that that's, you know, obviously largely uh, based on just the powerful images that are, you know, transmitted, mm -hmm. you know, in the media. And I just wanted to get your view on that and um, how do you feel about that. Right. I'm really glad that you brought that up because, you know, I think you're right that we, we look at people's surface physical characteristics like their skin color or their facial traits, their eye shape. We look at all kinds of stuff on the surface to figure out what race a person is in. But what's really interesting is that as you go around the world, you find out that different societies have different rules for putting people into races, and they have different ideas about which races there are in the world. And I'll just, you know, I'll just give you an example. Here in the United States, the way we classify people by race presently, we have an Asian race, which includes everybody pretty much from Pakistan to Japan. So in our, you know, in our racial concept of Asians, you can be a very dark-skinned person from southern India or Sri Lanka, or you could be a very fair-skinned person, let's say, from northern Japan. That, that would, for us, you know, those physical surface differences don't really matter. Whereas if you go to the UK, there, for them, those people are not of the same race. An Indian person is not part of the same race as, say, a Japanese or a Chinese person. So while they will okay. be, they'll be looking at people to figure out what race you're in, They'll have different. They'll have a a different set of races that they're trying to pigeon you hold, pigeonhole you in, and they'll have different ways of reading you physically to to you know assign you to one racial box or another. And we could take you know we could take a ton of examples. We could go to Brazil, right, where people mm -hmm. who we might say are we Americans might say are black would not consider themselves black. They would see themselves as being in another category. Um, there are time, you know, times and places where people think that Asians, the people that we see as Asian as white should be in the same category. You know, for a while there was the theory of people from South Asia as Caucasian people, so they should really be in a white category. I, I was just reading a paper by a geneticist making that argument. So, so that's what's interesting. We, we, all, we all think that we can tell a person's race from looking at them, but the funny thing is that if we went around the world, we wouldn't actually agree on what a person's face tells us about their race. Mm, okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that's an excellent point, because I found in my experience, and, and that's I won't be too long, but I found in my experience, like, for example, in China, um, you know, being like in the Southwest, uh, a lot of people would uh, just call out African in, in Chinese, mm -hmm. and... So, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, you did mention that there are rules, you know, in each country or region or various regions of the world, you know, on how race is determined, but, of course, they see me and they automatically, you know, assume, rightfully so, that, you know, I'm a, of African heritage. Um, and I got the same, you know, uh, treatment in Japan, you know, where... 
I'm sure you've heard there's a large, uh, I don't know, uh, what do you call it, uh, discrimination against mm -hmm. people of African descent there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've, I've just noticed that in my travels. Mm -hmm. So. But there's also, yeah, I mean, so, J Japan is an interesting case because there's also a lot of discrimination against people of Korean descent, which, you know, for us, they're all the same race. Yes, but Koreans and the Japanese don't feel that they are part of the same race. For them, they're different. Um, the Japanese are produced against the Burakumin, this kind of underclass of, of people that, again, we, you know, as Americans, we would think they're all in the same category, but they wouldn't say so. So, but, you know, you, you also, I think, bring up another important point, which is that precisely because of the, the European imperialist legacy that we've been talking about in this show, that right now, a lot, in a lot of places, local systems of categorization are being supplanted or changed by European ideas. So, you know, yeah. European categories have traveled in a way that, you know, let's say Chinese or Japanese categories have not traveled back to us in the same way. Right. Okay. Well, Professor Morning, thank you, and uh, also thank you for your service to the country and serving, thank and you. also thank you for your current work. Thank you. Thank you. You look. The person who dialed in last four digits, 2516, 2516, did you have a question for Professor Morning? No, I don't have a question. I was going to make a comment, so I'll just uh, listen to the show. Okay. Uh, the person that dialed in last four digits, 0289, 0289. Did you have a question for Professor Morning? Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, first, I want to say hello to everybody. Hello, Gus. Hello, Professor Morning. Um, I'm really enjoying the show. Thank I had you. two questions. And my first question would be, Professor Morning, what, what purpose do you feel that the construct of race serves? Okay. Do you want to tell, tell me the second question also, and then I answer oh, yeah. together? Yeah, and my second question is, would uh, non-white people mistreating other non-white people, would that be, oh, I mean, non-white people mistreating other non-white people on the basis of so-called, the, the, the so-called construct of race, would that be more of a reaction to a construct that's been um, imposed on them uh, rather than just something that's innate for people to go ahead and do anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to start with the, the first question, so what purpose does, if any, does race serve as a construct? So, you know, I, I think that Gus and I are going to be on the same page here on this, that the you know, that the concept of race, at least as we use it in the, you know, the Western world, was a concept that was invented entirely to justify domination, slavery, colonial exploitation, you know, the whole work. So it's really, race was an idea, it's a, it's a construct that was like, it was like a pretext or a rationale for something. It was a set of ideas that made it seem okay to go overseas and enslave people or colonize them or coerce their labor and sexually exploit them and the whole nine yards. Because race at its core was an idea which was which justified it justified European exploitation by arguing that other people, you know, either weren't worthy of other kinds of behavior or they weren't really human or, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that's, you know, what the origins were. That's why we have the race concept that we have today. Now, having said that, I think that since we have that idea and we all believe in it, more or less, what has happened is that the idea has taken on a life of its own so that even though we're no longer a slave society that is being administered by, you know, the British, that nonetheless we have the, the same old ideas and they still have these, you know, terribly, you know, pernicious Im effects on, on us. So since that is the kind of society that we are now, I think that we can and should use the racial categories that we've been saddled with to try to undo some of that legacy. And... It's almost like saying, okay, we've got to accept, we've got to stare in the face the fact that now here we are, a country where everybody feels like they're part of a different race. We have to grapple with that and acknowledge that reality before we can really move forward. And and so that's why I, 
you know, defend the use of census race categories because, again, I look at the example of France and I say, you know what, if we didn't even know how people of different races were being treated in the country, we, you know, we wouldn't have a anywhere to, you know, any firm ground to stand on to figure out how to get out of this, how to do something about the situation. So, so that's how I see, you know, why race was constructed to serve these immoral purposes, but that we can try to use the, the, the classifications that we have been left with, that we've inherited, to try to get our way out of the situation. So that's the purpose I see in those those um, categories. Then, um, in terms of your questions, so um, you know, let's say racism between non-white groups. You were asking, is that kind of a reaction? Yes, it's you know, it's basically well, people. Actually, not, not, not oh, racism. I'm sorry non-white groups, but non-white people mistreating other non-white people. Okay. Would you consider that to be racism or simply a reaction to what's been oh. imposed already? I see. Um, well, I guess, for me, those are the same thing. So, racism would be something that has been imposed on us as a society. So, I'm not mm-hmm. sure that I'm I'm getting the distinction. You, you also mentioned, though, you know, or is it something innate? Is there something innate going on? Um, right. And, and, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that, I think, has come up maybe a couple of times in our broadcast today. So some people argue that, you know, what what racism, in or racism is or racial hostility is is really just this kind of natural um, thing that human beings do. You know, some people think we're hardwired to be racist because we just naturally recognize that, people are of different races and we don't like them for that or we feel like we need to protect ourselves against them or whatever. So I, I don't I don't buy that at all, you know, simply because, you know, I don't think that races are natural. There's no natural way in which our species, our human species, divides up into races. So I don't think that there's anything natural or inevitable or hardwired about the ways in which we treat people. But I will say that... Um, uh, some researchers have shown, and I think this is persuasive, that that human beings are, in a sense, hardwired to make distinctions between other, you know, among different kinds of people. So we are hardwired to try to group people, other people, and for that matter, objects, but let's stick with people, that we're hardwired to try to group people, to make up groups of people and to pigeonhole people, assign them to those groups. Now, the, the people who make this argument are not at all saying that we naturally assign people to racial groups. The argument is just that we, we try to make groups, and but the kinds of groups that we assign people to depend entirely on the, the accident of the society that we find ourselves in. So, you know, in the United States, where we are brought up thinking about people as being members of different races, when we try to make groups, we pay attention to races, and we think the important groups to to put people into out there are racial groups. But we could be in other societies where the really important group would be your language group. You know, in Canada, do you speak English or French? You know, that's important. It could be what religion you are. Are you, you know, are you Christian or are you Muslim? You know, that could be the kind of framework that people gravitate to. So I don't think that there's anything innate or hardwired about us sorting people into racial groups. You know, we, I do think that we, we are all we are hardwired to make groups, but the fact that they're racial groups is just you know it's just the way our particular society has chosen to do things. Well, I, I appreciate that answer, and you know what, I agree with you on the part about it not being innate. I think that's uh, very true. The, let me make one distinction, though. Mm-hmm. Um, you were talking about we were talking about how race uh, was basic was partly based on um, colonization for them to justify going ahead on and dominating other groups of people. So when it comes to non-white people that I run into who are making distinctions based on groups, which I do, I do that, I discriminate definitely, and I'm, I'm very prejudiced um, as far as what I do personally. But the colonization, the conquest, and the, the whole um, taking over and using race to take over another group of people. I don't see that trait exhibited with non-white people. Mm. Well, you know, I, so I mentioned that, well, you know, partly 
I think that we don't see that as clearly because since we are ourselves a former European colony, and you know, here we are now speaking English, a European language, we, we're effectively living in an outpost of, of Europe. And one consequence of that is that the only history we, we know is European history for most of us. I mean, that, that's what we get. So we don't know a whole heck of a lot about the kinds of divisions that people have made in other societies. But, you know, from what I do know from my work in the Middle East, for example, and some of the work I cited earlier on the program where people looked at what happened when, you know, uh, Muslims were, were colonial powers, so when you had the Islamic empire expanding around the world, you know, that again, you in those circumstances, you got, um, you know, you got divisions that looked, you know, kind of like our, our race idea. So, um, so I think that if we knew history a little bit better, especially the history of non-European people, I think we would see instances of more non-Europeans mistreating and racializing other non-European people. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Professor. I appreciate that, and um, I don't have any more questions. Once again, I think it's a great show, and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Right on. Uh, I know our listeners, you all have a tendency to wait till the last minute and try to slide in with your question. Uh, to preempt that, uh, you should get your hand up now if you have a question for Professor Ann J. Morning. Don't wait till the last minute. Uh, we didn't even get to talk that much about the book. I'm going to see if I can get some in now. Uh, Professor Morning is just so cool. She is so smart and uh, just so <laughs> cool to talk to. Most of the people we have on the program, uh, not that I have a problem with it because we are talking about racism, which in my view is war against non-white people, so I don't mind it being uh, contentious uh, on the program, but she is just so cool even when we don't agree on things. It's, uh, oh, thank you, she's so It's a pleasure. For sure. that We will have to uh, get you back so we can talk about the book because I had read and took a notes and we didn't even get to talk that much. So I'm going right. to read a little bit and get you to uh, respond if you would. You start sure. your book. This is on page one, introduction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, even before my first child was born, her race and mine seemed to, be, seemed to matter. Most of the pamphlets my doctor gave me about potential birth defects made reference to groups such as African-Americans and Caucasians or they mentioned ethnicity. A brochure from a company called Genzyme Genetics, for example, calculated a mother's risk of being a carrier of cystic fibrosis according to whether she was Northern European, Southern European, Ashkenazi Jewish, Hispanic, African American, or Asian American. When I was 12 weeks pregnant, my doctor ordered a blood test that would indicate how likely the baby was to have a certain chromosomal disorder, to have certain chromosomal disorders such as Down syndrome. Before drawing my blood, a nurse asked me to state my race. Usually, I describe myself as African American, but on that day, piqued by curiosity about what race had to do with my unborn child's health, I gave the full version of my ancestry African, European, American Indian, and Asian. Oh, the nurse replied, as she noted my answer on a form. So you go in the other box. (laughs) Since her birth, my four-year-old daughter has been racially classified on several occasions. Within 24 hours of delivery, Sophia received her first official racial designation. Her birth certificate required her mother's and her father's race. Dutifully, I filled in black, but my Italian-born husband went into a huff and muttering that his daughter would be a racial left the item blank a week or two later when we took Sophia to doctor to a doctor's visit the hospital admissions clerk insisted that they needed to know her race before she could be seen wow for for someone who studied race for a living I was surprisingly unprepared for the question hmm I pondered multiracial that's not an option the clerk told us we'll just put race unknown Since those early days, my daughter's race has even been required on nursery school applications. It is probably just the beginning of what will be a lifetime of forms, checkboxes, and computer codes that all designate race. In short, a typical American experience. Uh, Why did you start the book off in this manner? And is your husband Irish descent? Is he someone who is accepted as white? 
Mm. So, um, first of all, I started the book off this way because I wanted to, first of all, remind people or get people thinking about how often it is that we get asked our race. Because I think that we're so used to it. You know, we fill it out on all kinds of forms, on school forms, in the workplace, in doctor's offices, that I think we don't necessarily stop and notice it or realize how often we're being asked about this. And then the other reason that I wanted to start with that example of having to fill out all these forms about race was to then, you know, prod people to think, well, what information are we exactly giving people when we tell them what our race is? That is, what, what do we think that race information is being used for? You know, do we think we're telling people something about our genetic makeup or about our cultural practices or our, you know, political affiliation or, you know, what have you? So so I just wanted to open with an experience that I thought a lot of people could relate to that is filling out these forms um, and get them to start thinking about what they, you know, what they believe that writing down black or white or Asian or whatever, what, what they think, how they think that information gets used and interpreted. Then, in terms of my my husband at the time, who's no longer my husband, but um, that's okay, he's still in the book. So he's um, from Italy. He was born in Italy and grew up in Italy and just came here for, for graduate school, which is where I met him. So he grew up in a system, like the French system, where they don't use racial categories. And so for him, it's, you know, it's a weird thing to have to do that. And you ask, well, is he taken as white? I would say... He is largely here unless people maybe mistake his Italian for Spanish and think that he is, you know, therefore Hispanic or Latino. But um, but the funny thing is that in Italy, which is actually where I'm doing my current research, so I've, I finished this book on the nature of race, and now I'm doing a, a book where I'm looking at how people think about racial and other kinds of difference in Europe um, today. He, in a situation like that, he didn't even grow up thinking about himself as white or not white. And this, it's funny, this I think comes back to something you said earlier, Gus, about, you know, well, white people really understand what race is. It's just the rest of us who are confused. Um, In a way, what it is, I think, is that whites have the luxury of not thinking about race. So, you know, they don't, perhaps they're not confused because in a sense they don't have tough questions to ask themselves. They don't, they don't necessarily identify with being racist in an, in an overt, explicit way because, in a sense, it's it's something that's just very deeply that people don't have to think about. And let me, I'll, I'll try to give you a, an example to get a little more concrete with what I mean. But so you've probably noticed that, um, for example, you can go into a store. Or, well, you know, I don't know if this is as true on the West Coast as here, but um, you know, if I go to a store and I see an aisle which is marked ethnic foods. I know that what that ethnic is supposed is telling me is basically non-white or non-European, that this is going to be the aisle where I'm going to find, you know, supposedly Mexican food or Chinese food or Vietnamese food or something other than what the, what normal food is supposed to be, right? So racial labels tend to act that way, that they're really used to mark off what seems weird or deviant from the norm. And since whiteness is the norm or the default, it's almost like this invisible category that people don't actually have to name or use. And some academics, they, they say it's the, you know, the null signifier or the invisible signifier, just meaning it's, it's like the default category. So because race often acts like that, that kind of system what it does is tend to make whiteness seem like a normal thing that doesn't need to be named, and the only kinds of races that you ever need to name or use a label for are non-white races. Those are the deviant groups or the weird, uh, non-normal, non-mainstream races. And I think there are a lot of ways in which we use language today that gets that feeling across. We use euphemisms like multicultural when we're really talking about just non-white people, like, oh, that's a, it's a very multicultural uh, group over there, or I'm going to write an article for multicultural women when people, what people really mean is I'm writing a, an article for women of color or whatever. So, um, so all of this <laughs> gets me back to your question about how my daughter's father was, was seen in racial terms. You know, yes, I, I think he gets seen as white, but I think like many people who have the privilege of being taken for white, they don't have to think about it so much. 
um, they kind of get a pass and, and don't need to think about it because what they are is just normal, regular people, you know, in this default mainstream way of thinking. Hmm. That, that is another one. It comes up pretty regularly uh, on the program. Let's see if I can I uh, be quick. Um, and that, that's another one. I just I, I do not think that that is accurate with regards to white people not thinking about mm-hmm. racism, white supremacy. Uh, and the way I explain is okay. if we rewind and not that far back, we okay. just rewound 50 years. Uh, and I would say 50 years, we could be here. We could be in South Africa. We could mm-hmm. be in England. Just rewinding 50 years, it would be pretty much impossible to make an argument that white people don't think about racism. If we rewind in this area of the world, just 50 years ago, you still got white people who are arguing about whether or not they're going to take the signs down about where non-white people, black people specifically, can get a drink of water. If anything, I would say white people are ubiquitous with regards to their thinking about racism. It is one of the primary things that white people think about at all times. In fact, I would say it's the default. And I know some of the white people that we've had on the program, I've told them it's so constant that I think for white people, they don't have to be conscious of it because it's something that they're always doing. It's almost like breathing you don't have to think about breathing because you're doing it all the time. You just, you don't even think, oh yeah, I'm breathing. I'm blinking my eyes. I think that's the way racism, white supremacy is for white people. It's so constant. It's so ever present. No, I don't have to think about it. The times where it becomes salient, then it pops up for whatever reason. If the system is being challenged as it was in the 1960s all around the world, then I think it becomes very obvious that, yes, I do think about this. And I think of myself as a white person. And for white people, I understand what that means in relation to everybody on this planet who I classify white people, who we classify as not white. Uh, And I think that's one of those things I I would encourage the non-white people who listen to the program to think about it uh, in detail. That's one of my rhetorical questions. What does it mean to be a white person? That should be thought about in detail, uh, in my view, non-white people are the ones that are confused about what, about that. White people got that clearly. And I will use yesterday's program as an example. Those young 18-year-old students at San Jose State University, I don't think anybody is going to be able to convince me that they don't think about racism. They don't know what it means to be white when they are terrorizing a black student and calling him three-fifths. You can't tell me that these white, and these are not white PhD students. These are not white grad students. These are not 30, 40, 50, 60 year old, old crotchety white men from Mississippi. This is in San Jose, California, 18 year old white freshman calling a black student three fifths. And this sort of thing happens all the time, particularly on college campus where you get all sorts of tacky and trifling examples of white people who seem to be very aware of what it means to be white and their relationship to everyone else they classify as non-white. Particularly, I'd go to your example in Italy. They might not use our specific terms, classifications, and what have you, but there is a reason I know the name uh, Dr. Cicel Kayenji. There is a reason I know that name. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because white people practice racism, white supremacy worldwide in some of the most tacky and trifling forms Uh, This black female, she's a politician there and she's a doctor. That's something that gets lost in the shuffle. She's not just some ignorant person uh, who came there who doesn't know anything and affirmative action. She got this job or she was elected just because we felt sorry for this black. She is a medical doctor as well. And she experiences the most vile, ridiculous forms of racism. You have white people come in. These are white elected officials, not just some ruffians to say, oh, these are just ignorant white people. These will be elected white officials in Italy Italy, saying things like she should be raped, throwing bananas at her. And this is like on a daily basis. We've played so many clips of the abuse and torment that she has experienced uh, on a constant basis uh, that I would just, this is ubiquitous. This is what it means to be white worldwide. Uh, if you if you want, you can let me know, because like I said, you are clearly super intelligent. You can let me know if anything I just said, if it doesn't make sense uh, before we wrap things up. And I thought I wanted to check to see if we had one other caller, but I wanted to get your response. What I just said, did that make sense or am I talking crazy? No, it did. And, you know, unfortunately, this is going to have to be my last comment because we're because um, I'm out of time now. But um, first of all, I'm so glad that you're talking about the case about Minister Kienge in Italy, because that is uh, just a jaw dropping 
jaw-droppingly spectacular case of racism, and, and everybody should know about it, even if we don't particularly follow what's going on in Italy. But um, but I guess what I, what I want to get at is, I, I see what you're saying, Gus, but if you think back to that moment when you were talking about people being, white people being unconscious they're they're doing things it's 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 like it's breathing they don't have to think about it they're engaging in a system of white supremacy that they're not giving a second thought and it's that that weird that weird combination where people are actively part of a system of white supremacy of racial discrimination but at the same time they weirdly don't necessarily think they are or know that they are. Now, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to um, let people off the hook or, or I'm, I'm not talking about people who are, you know, in, or trying to say, oh, people are innocent or something. But I do think that to really understand the way racism works today, we cannot think about it as something like the Ku Klux Klan, where people got, you know, active and got themselves dressed up and rode out into the night, organized with this very conscious plan of action and a whole crystallized worldview about white supremacy and all of that. I think the the harder thing for us to get our minds around and what makes racism so, so slippery today and so difficult, at least for some people, to pinpoint and, and all of that is because sincerely, people can be part of a system of privilege and not think that they are or not realize that they are, you know, not realize that they benefit in society by being white. They may not believe that at all, let alone think about themselves or, you know, identify strongly as being white or not on some conscious level. So it's just that what you talked about, that unconscious, that lack of awareness that, that I, I think is important to remember. So that, that's all I want to add. The website again is www.annmorning.com. Uh, her 2011 book, The Nature of Race, sounds like she has another book that might be coming out uh, sometime soon. Uh, I'm will, hoping, yeah. <laughs> we will stay tuned. Uh, thoroughly enjoy the conversation, Professor Morning. Uh, like five. I will think on uh, what you shared with us, and we will definitely be in touch to see about having you back on the programs and continuing the dialogue. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you to all of your listeners. Absolutely. <laughs> Take care. Have, have a good evening, Dr. Morgan. You too. Bye-bye. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, the conversation was very different from reading the book. Uh, we'll take a commercial, and I'll see if any folks have any comments. Uh, reading the book. It was not a pleasant experience for Mr. Gus T. Renegade. Uh, when I read uh, her book, uh, I was just, uh, you, she married to a white person, or she was, they're not together anymore, thankfully, but she was married to a white person, had a child with a white person. You know how I feel about that. That had a big influence on me reading, and particularly because that's on like page one, literally that is on page one of the book. So, I mean, that had a huge influence. And then um, I felt like there was a lot of universalism, uh, which I brought up on the program about the the we, as though we're all in this together, or we, all non-white people, black people, we all participated in the formation of these racial classifications, and that that by I mean, it just uh, it was not a, a pleasant experience. It was kind of frustrating for me reading uh, the book, which I talked about before. But uh, she just with the experience. I mean, you can look at at her uh, resume and all the things that she uh, has done. Uh, working overseas. Uh, this some, She worked at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. That right there, I mean, I don't get to talk to too many people who have worked at the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, I just feel like she has a lot of uh, information. I feel like white people are really good at that. They will get non-white people who are smart, intelligent. I think most most of us have the ability to be extremely intelligent and to process a lot of information. They just don't give us the opportunity, but they will get the ones of us who have a great deal of intellectual abilities and just totally corrupt them and have them, you know, working for them and doing things that benefit them. Uh, and I just, man, if she uh, hadn't been married to that white person or she, you know, had got some information, Dr. Welsing's material, Mr. Fuller's material, other non-white folks, Dr. Cambon, other folks who have written, talked about racism, white supremacy. I think that, uh, man, she could be doing all-star work trying to unravel this here uh, 
this here system. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad the conversation was much more enjoyable than my experience reading the book. I would be uh, interested in having her back on to kind of talk about some of the things that she uh, brings up in her book. Uh, I will take our commercial and then I'll see if any of the folks that are listening, if they had, I know one of the listeners said he had a comment, so I'll make sure you can get your comment in. And then also uh, I wanted to see if if that makes sense. Because I have not worked at the Federal Reserve Bank or done anything else. Uh, I'm a confused victim of racism. If you all think that that would minimize confusion amongst non-white people, if those categories on the census got stripped and you just had white and non-white. And I, I again, I'm not saying that this would eliminate racism or even reduce racism. Just would that minimize, remove some of the confusion on the part of non-white people. That's all I, I wanted to see if that makes sense. Uh, if you don't think so, that's fine too. You can you know, feel free to share. We'll do a quick commercial break and then we will be right back. Context of white supremacy. I heard the word fair a lot today too. I was going to bring that up as well, but uh, yeah, just I was not slacking on my job on that either. I heard fair quite a bit uh, mentioned on the program today. That is uh, important. Folks should be paying attention to that as well, but we'll be right back. Context of white supremacy. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Justice with the Cows Radio program. If you want to learn about, understand, and counter racism, white supremacy, be sure not to miss a cow's episode. We keep them jammed, packed with constructive information to sharpen your use of words to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, ASAP. Also, to be able to invest in my counter-racist efforts, co-hosting the cow's radio program, please visit my blog, Just Do Justice Today. Blogspot.com. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. I got an uncle real crazy. My uncle B, 55 years old, hates.
hates white people married to a white lady. And he's sitting around going, you know, these crackers ain't shit. Except for Susan. And he tried to explain the whole thing to me one day. Say, yeah, 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 I got a white wife. I love her. She loved me. That's all that matter. But I tell you this, if the revolution ever come, I'll kill her first. <laughs> just to show these crackers I mean business. <laughs> motherfucker cracker ass, motherfucker cracker. She a cracker, motherfucker. Well, hey, hey, hi, honey. <laughs> motherfucker cracker, I'll kill my cracker kid too. <laughs> Italy's first black cabinet minister has been compared to an orangutan by a fellow colleague, but says she doesn't let it bother her. I don't take it personally, as you said. I am a lighting rod. <laughs> Integration Minister Cecile Kienge spoke just after Senate Vice President Roberto Calderoli, leader of the anti-immigrant Northern League, said he would not resign for making a racist slur against Kienge, comparing her to an orangutan. Since April, when she was made integration minister, Kiengi has been targeted by racial slurs from the Northern League. Calderoli, who made the comment, said he was sorry and that he would send her a bouquet of flowers. Kiengi came to Italy from the Congo as a student to study nearly 30 years ago. The 48-year-old said she hopes she can change the perceptions Italians have about immigrants. This is a personal path. A path that each one of us has taken in our own lives. It's clear that my path has not been an easy one. It has been difficult in terms of integration, in terms of professional affirmation, even in terms of the possibility of being able to study. Therefore, every step was more difficult. It's clear that all this is a part of personal path, to help them understand what are the most important things and to make a choice about what things one needs to dedicate more attention to and to, above all, to be able to translate, which I ask of everyone. To translate one's discomfort, and I am speaking about the discomfort of many people, to translate this discomfort into a different language, not a violent one, but into a message that might improve the system. Italy's Jewish community was one of the first groups to stand behind Kiengi and issued a collective statement saying she had all the solidarity of Italian Jews. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I, again, with uh, Dr. Cecil Kiengi, uh, there are too many reports, incidents of tacky and trifling white terrorism to name, as I said, throwing bananas at her. A uh, different white person said that she should be raped. Uh, I mean, this is just ongoing. Uh, I got to a point uh, during the summer, you know, it was almost on a daily basis uh, that something was happening. Uh, and she has been so uh, dignified in her response to this. Uh, I think when they were throwing bananas uh, at her and the same foolishness from this past summer, uh, she was saying, man, we're wasting food. That's Italy is one of those countries. They're having all sorts of economic problems, talking about their economy is all messed up. And they're like, you're wasting food. You're out throwing bananas, practicing racism uh, at a time when people don't have enough to eat. Man, come on. Come on. And she's a medical doctor. That should not be uh, minimized, uh, taken for granted at all. Medical doctor, politician, and that's the way that she's being uh, being treated. I don't know if they... Uh, consider themselves like they go around calling each other whites, but I'm quite sure they know how to function as racist white supremacists. I have no doubt about that. It also reminded me we had a black female on the program. Uh, this was the summer of 2011. She played basketball internationally. She played basketball in Italy and it was the same trifling terroristic antics it was in the middle of a game and a white person started going off and doing the same thing that you see with soccer all the time, the way that they abuse the black players. She was actually on the program and she talked about the incident that happened to her uh, from this past summer. So uh, you can go back in the archives. I'll get uh, the name and exact date uh, so that you all can go back and check that as well. But I'm quite sure uh, the folks in Italy, they know the distinction between the folks that they classify as black 
not white, and how to function. Uh, I'm quite sure you're not going to escape white supremacy racism if you go there. Uh, again, we'll see if the folks, I know one of the folks that dialed in said that they had a comment, and then we'll see if any uh, other folks had any other uh, commentary on what they heard during the broadcast today. Hopefully it was a constructive investment of your uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, the person, see, we have uh, 404 9817 and the caller is 7537. Your three lines should all be open. There are other folks who have comments. Uh, just press star six if you want to share. Oh, greetings, Gus. Um, did the other guy, did he get a chance to say what he wanted to say? The one with the comments? Is he still online? Hello? I was listening. I don't know if he's still here or not, but uh, all the people that had a hand up, your lines are open. Okay. Um, yeah, it was most informative because I thought it was going to be one of those type shows where people who were sexually involved where it was going to kind of deteriorate down into the sex question, but I'm glad that it was more on an academic level and, you know, it, it was pleasant compared to the one two days ago with the, the, with the young lady in the Orange County film thing. <laughs> but, but I digress. You know, one thing I'm going to give her a little pushback on is the situation she was speaking on in, with the Asian category. Asia is a continent. It's not a people. It's only people who call themselves white have decided to put people into that category and call them as, as being Asian. You can be from India, you can be from Japan, Korea, China, whatever. You are considered Asia as the continent where you are from. But your ethnic background, it, broke, it breaks down based on what country you were born in on that continent. So they are the, they are the ones who put this, this confusion out here. The same thing with North Africa. She was speaking about the people in North Africa and how with the racial categorization. The people in North Africa who are in the dominant position, which are people who came out of Central Asia, Eurasia, out of the Caucasus, Caucasus um, region, they are white. They are what now our people are called white. So they're the ones who are in control with the Arab, the religion of Islam, and all of that. It are, it, 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 it's, it's those people. So therefore, they, they, are, they are instituted a form of racism over there, a form of color coding, where people who are black, like me and you, we are still at the very bottom of that list because you've read of all of the mistreatment of the Ethiopians and the other Africans and people from other parts of Asia, like Bangladesh, India, who come over there as workers and now they're mistreated, they're not paid, they're beaten, and all of the other mistreatment they are given, but Africans are treated worse. I've been in North Africa, and I, and I can tell you for a fact that they are treated the worst. And it's always the people that you see on TV all the time, those straight hair people who call themselves Arabs, who are nothing more than people that come, came out of the Balkan region, who are white, that are running the show. I uh, am downloading that book, uh, the one that she mentioned, I'm down or I just got it right now, uh, Bruce Hall, A History of Race in Muslim West Africa. Uh, that is my suspicion. I say again, I'm ignorant. Uh, I have not been to North Africa. Uh, I am very or poorly informed uh, about all of that, but I am going to read the book and see if we can get him to be a guest on the program. But my suspicion uh, is just what she explained. It sounds, I mean, it's, it's identical. It sounds exactly like system of white supremacy, what white people do, terrorize, dominate, non-white people, especially individuals they classify as black. And she said that the black people were not in charge. It just sounds like these individuals probably could be white people who just went in and do what white people do, terrorize black people. Uh, I could be, I could be an error, but it, and particularly anything happening on the continent of Africa. I mean, that's just, I could be wrong though. So I, I don't want to say a whole lot. I'm going to get the book or I already got the book. I'm going to see if we can get uh, Bruce S. Hall, he's a professor at Duke. He's in their African and African American Studies Department. Uh, it doesn't have a picture. I was curious if this is a white person or a non-white person, but uh, we will. We'll see if we can get him on the program. Yeah, it, it should be most informative. But if you go to Morocco, 
the people in Morocco, they look white. They look like those Albanians, some like the like Kardashians who are, look like white. That's, that's, how they, that's what they look like. The majority of the people who are in charge of the finance, education, all of those things, they look white. You go to Turkey, it's the same thing. People who look white. So, and they, that's how they got there. Just the Egyptians, they all came in, they invaded the Hyksos that came out of Central Asia, and they came up into that part of the, the, the country, northern part, and they established themselves. They dominate, they, they killed off the Nubians, and they did all of the atrocities, and they put themselves in power. It's like the whites did over here with the, with the um, so-called Native Americans and, the, and Africans. So to tell me that it's indigenous people, no, they, those people are not indigenous to that region. They're invaders that came out of Central Asia that are in that part of Arabia as well as in North Africa. And they use racism just like the other Europeans did in Western Europe to conquer and plunder. Mm -hmm. uh, the... Other folks who doubt it, I don't know if the, the person who said they had a comment, I don't know if uh, you're still there, but everyone who had a hand up, your line should be open. Uh, the person at 7537 should be with us as well. If anybody else have uh, thoughts on the program or anything they wanted to share? Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, um, I, I, I too thought that this program was uh, very constructive. It wasn't combative. You know, we were all in the same universe, if you remember that program. But... Um, with the uh, census question that you talked about, um, I think that it would alleviate a lot of confusion if people saw the data that would uh, come out of whether people were white or non-white and see that white people are actually the minority in all over the world. And I think that would uh, help people really think about what it means to be white because for me, when I say that I'm non-white, that is to, not to negate myself, but to actually point out that I am not a white person, you know, because if you look at white people, um, and, and you know, we, we hear this all the time that sometimes black people want to be white. I, I, will, I will, When I say that I'm not white, I want to make the distinction that, hey, I am not white and there's something wrong with being white. And that's why I want, wanted to point out. Hmm. Definitely appreciate that commentary. I'm still I'm still processing on that uh, myself. I was glad that uh, we got some exchange on that portion about the census and making that change. The more I thought about it, even after we you know moved on to other other topics, the concept of race. Mr. Fuller had said that uh, it was recently. I heard him say that he said. In order to eliminate racism, we're in the process of producing justice. We're going to have to let go of those racial classifications uh, and thinking of people as so-called Asian and even black. And I know that is, man, woo, that is not a popular one amongst black people uh, and saying we're going to have to let go of those racial classifications. But he said, I think that would be that's what it would look like. The process of doing away with racism, white supremacy, it would be tossing those classifications because it's foolishness anyway. All of it. Uh, what I think 404, what she touched on, uh, was saying Asian. Everybody, I mean, just that everybody is supposed to be Asian if you are someone who was born in and you have a certain uh, phenotypical characteristics. If you were born in India, if you were born in Pakistan, if you were born in Japan, if you were born in South Korea, if you were born in Thailand, all of that is supposed to be Asian. Now, I mean, just that right there. I mean, really? Really? And even black. Now, you're going to tell me everybody on the continent of Africa, that's supposed to be one race, everybody that's there. And then now it's supposed to include also all the dark people that are in the Caribbean, here, Brazil, all of that's supposed to constitute one race with all the different types of people that you have, tall people, short people, all of pygmies, all of that's supposed to be one quote unquote race. I just confusion, I think. Tossing all of that, I think it would reduce confusion, but I could be in error. And just to what the, the mail caller just pointed out about really highlighting white people. And that, that's what I say all the time. There's one race, if nothing more than making that clear. There is one race. 
small group of people that are responsible for all of our problems, all of the conflict on the planet, I think it could go a long way to just isolating and keeping our focus where it should be, and that is on the problem, white people. But I couldn't be in error, and I'll, uh, I'm going to think on that some more, uh, just if that, would, if that would minimize confusion. But I can't, uh, I can't imagine it being any worse than some other race and other and multiracial and biracial and multiple selections. I can't imagine it being any worse, uh, but I, I could be. I'll think on it some more and, uh, and see. Uh, the person at 2516, you should be with us as well. Do you have... Uh, thoughts on the program or other things you want to share? Yes. yes, I just wanted to say, I think you went too easy on the guest. I don't care if she is a so-called victim. Uh, and number two, I think her census data was 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 uh, disingenuous because if I know, she has to know with her so-called superior intelligence. She has to know that North Africans and everybody else, because uh, whites are only... Uh, less than 10% of the global population, they uh, change the rules of what constitutes whiteness uh, to their benefit. And those that they don't have uh, uh, as white, uh, so-called, they uh, have as uh, racial allies. And she has to know this, uh, especially since she, she works for the devil in the Federal Reserve Bank and everywhere else. She has to know this. Uh, but uh, I thought I just thought was the whole thing was she thinks she thinks she's slick and she's trying to be disingenuous and uh, cunning. But I could see right through it. And uh, but you said the act you said you wanted people to uh, to call for questions, so that's why I declined to say anything. I just wanted to make a comment, and uh, that was basically it. What did you think she did? You think she was being purposely uh, dishonest? With yes. Some- yes, I do. Yes. Oh, okay. You couldn't have just asked a question about what she thought she was not being truthful about? Uh, the whole thing, what I just related about the census, about the, uh, the change in the uh, definition of whiteness to uh, fit, fit their advantage. It's like, you, you, to use America as an example, their numbers are dwindling rapidly. So, so now so-called Latinos, they can be considered as white. I thought, the, uh, and I, I'm saying this uh, tongue-in-cheek, so don't take offense. Uh, I thought Latinos were supposed to be wet that. How come they're whites now? So it's, and if I know all of this information, she has to know it. I thought she did say, I thought she admitted uh, some of the points she just brought up. I thought she said that the population of white people is dwindling. I think I brought up the point about the some of the so-called Latinos or Hispanics, some of them being accepted as white. Uh, I think I referenced Cameron Diaz specifically in saying that you can have people that, you know, identify and say, yeah, I'm a white person or a white Hispanic. I think they even got that on the census. I don't think she disagreed with that. I think uh, she was in, did, do you remember that? That, that did happen, right? Yeah, and, and as far as the uh, one drop rule, that's a joke, too, because uh, uh, so what if uh, some black people have went with white people and any other people uh uh, as far as we know, blacks are the original. So uh, even if you do have a white any or whatever else, all white and, and uh, so-called Asian and anything else, all it is a variation on the same thing. So uh, uh, it's either uh, climatological biology or biology, bi- biological climatology, so it doesn't matter. And uh, I just think, this is just my opinion, I just think she was being disingenuous. And, uh, and that's the... And her uh, discontinuousness is the reason, one of the reasons why she's in all those positions, because they don't, they know that she's a good worker for them, and that's, that's just the way I see it. Uh, I I love to see the uh, comments of the other colleagues, what they thought, think of what I just said. And, uh, just like the lady called, called you earlier, I appreciate your show, and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and I have one question uh, for you personally. Do you, do you think it's foolishness to celebrate Thanksgiving Day? Because I think it is. Uh, I know it's a little bit off the topic, but uh, I just wanted to uh, ask your personal opinion on that. And uh, I'll listen off, offline. Uh, I can do that quick about the Thanksgiving so that other people can come. I don't celebrate anything. Uh, I don't celebrate birthdays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, uh, April Fool's. Uh, I don't celebrate anything. Uh, I don't think... Uh, we have anything to celebrate under the system of racism, white supremacy. I think uh, our guest who was on the program this Sunday uh, in Kosi Mandari, I think that he had that in his book specifically. I don't recall if I read that. Pa- I, th- I did. I read the passage uh, this Sunday uh, and he said exactly that uh, in the pitiful position that we are in. We have 
nothing to celebrate. So no, I don't celebrate. And I hope that's been evidenced on the program. I think we have been broadcasting for most of the so-called holidays as we will be tomorrow. Dr. Welsing will be with us tomorrow evening. So yeah, I don't celebrate anything. I'm with you on that, uh, and the callers. I don't celebrate anything, and I've always been like that. But your caller and what he was stating with in regards to the racial categorization, and when she was stating that her husband wanted the child to be a racial, I'm just saying that this this, this, is, this doesn't make any kind of sense. It shows you how he realized the predicament that his daughter, he know he is white. And he know he had a child with a non-white, which is what white people have always done. They have went around the globe procreating with, um, with people who are not white, making offspring, and then they leave them in there and then create all kinds of categories for them because they want the white to remain pure. So he was not about to go ahead and, and put the child as being white, but then again, she can't be black. So now she got to be out here in limbo. Uh-huh. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to the point of that 404 made about the, uh, the I think 404 made it or one of the other callers just about the, the when the guests were saying that uh, all of the, uh, all of the, the different populations that make up the, the the Asian continent, you know, being, you know, called all Asian. Um, I just think that's ironic because if if one really delves back into history and not not this farce, farce, I don't know, farce like history that's taught in in schools, but if you really do the research, a lot of these indigenous populations of like. A, you know, these different Asian countries like Vietnam, for example, I I didn't know that the indigenous, indigenous original peoples were dark-skinned, copper-colored people, and um, as they were here, you know, in the Americas. And then, of course, you know, with, I guess, white colonization, you know, the population was supplanted by, you know, lighter-skinned people. So I just think that that's ironic, you know, so... It's, it's not only that. It's, um, all nations, they form into tribes. They were never there mm-hmm. anything about black, white, I'm Nigerian, and all this other. These names came about as a result of colonization. It was that I'm a Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, Asante, whatever tribe it is you were, you were a tribe first and foremost, and you were, um, you were not no so-called country or nation state. Europeans are the ones who came up with this because... They have to conquest, they have to create divisions and conflict, as they have been doing. So that's why they came up with these countries and put people into them and start telling you what you need to call yourself. Now, the census information, I've never filled out a census. The last one that came, my husband, I, I just tore it up and threw it in the trash. So when people are running around here trying to say how many so-called blacks that have in the Americas, we have never filled out a census. There are four of us in my family, four blacks. We have never put it on a census form. So these numbers that they come up with out the ear to say how many they have running around here, it is all fictitious that statisticians sat around and they just, you know, came up with out the ear and they make up these assumptions. Black people, as far as I'm concerned, this country, our numbers are greater than in the 40-plus million that they're trying to say that you're in. Because no one has ever went around and physically tapped everyone on the shoulder and says, okay, one, two, three, and then, you know, here we come up with the 40-some million. Yeah. At least for me, I would have to listen to the program again as to whether the guest uh, was being deliberate with her statement about be, uh, being deliberate, deliberately lying with her, st- or with her statements. But um, I did notice that whenever Gus would say something, she would agree to it, even though it did kind of <clears throat> did kind of uh, contradict what she earlier said. But um, but I'll have to listen to the program again to actually verify that. Her 
her definition of racism, discrimination, bias, prejudice, it's all comes it's all jumbled. And I guess she said, you know, that's her opinion, that's how she wants to put it. And I guess as we said, when you involve in sexually with white people you become somewhat contaminated and become more confused than the rest of us. So she is some or the other trying to justify her daughter because her daughter fits into this picture some kind of way and she has to ease whatever it is that this child is going to eventually um, experience. But all of this, you know, straddling the fence, I now want to call things as it is. I want to put us all in this box as being potentially racist. This is where this mess has come about as a result of the media trying to push it that, yeah, we're all prejudiced. We, no, excuse me, that we're all racist, that blacks can be racist, and all this other nonsense that has been going around, and, and black people have been repeating. That's why I love Dr. Claude Anderson, because he broke it down in a nutshell, and he, and he just put it out there and said, y'all could agree or not, but this is what it is, and this is how, this is racism, this is bias, this is prejudice, and take it or leave it, but this is what it is, and don't get yourself confused. Even though I think... Uh 404, I think you made the comparison between today's program and the program from Monday, where we had uh, Shandell Maxwell. She was the filmmaker for uh, Behind the Behind the Black Curtain. Excuse me, Black Behind the Black Curtain. Uh, is that it? I'm messing up the name of the documentary film. Uh, yeah, the orange curtain. Yes, behind the orange curtain. Black behind the orange curtain. That's what it is. Black behind the orange curtain. Black behind the orange curtain. There we go. Uh, the difference between the two, I think you see, a lot, or at least I, a lot of similarities with defending white people, not wanting to isolate and talk about. And I think they both were saying institutional racism. Uh, I think I raised that point when she said you keep saying white people, white people and its institutions. I think uh, Miss Maxwell, I think she said the same thing on Monday. I think both of them, my error, I couldn't be making an error, but I think both of them said that they thought non-white people could. Yep, they did. Both of them said that they thought non-white people could practice racism against white people. Uh, those are patterns that I note if it's a non-white person. And they have been in a tragic arrangement where I see where their thinking, their understanding of racism has been greatly compromised. Now, I know there are non-white people who think that way, who are not sexually involved with a white person. But it's been my experience that the tendency for that sort of thinking, what I believe is incorrect thinking, it skyrockets when you are laying down with the enemy. That's why I said at the beginning, I love what her mom said. She said that her mom, you're sleeping with the enemy and I'd be disappointed if you hooked up with a white person, like thumbs up to uh, professor morning's mom right on. Uh, that yes. was grand <laughs> to hear that. Uh, if her mom can hear the program, kudos, kudos, wish we had more parents who bring. And I would say that's a major difference. I said that when I first started studying racism, that tends to not work. Like I heard that and it didn't have an impact on me. People just saying, I'd be disappointed if you hooked up with a white person or you're spitting on our, any anything like that. It has to, in my view, it has to be connected to we are in a system of racism. This is one of the ways that white people practice racism, sleeping, sexually sewering non-white people this is not just an emotional even though i do have an emotional feeling about you know if it was my child or someone i care about but i mean that notwithstanding this is an act of racism you are putting yourself in harm's way you are bringing a terrorist to your family and saying yes i want this racist to be welcomed into our home our family event it would have to be or at least for me it would have to be explained that way for it to make sense for me to grasp Oh, OK, this is a behavior that I shouldn't engage in because there's a war being waged against us. This is what it means to be a white person. Got it. Not just, you know, don't bring her home if she can't use our comb. And that's what I mean. That just <laughs> clearly it has not. I mean, clear. it's obvious that has not worked. We're going to have to do a little bit better with refining how we go about explaining that. Uh, the person at 0289, you should be with us as well. 
Yeah, I am um, really, really pleased with the show today. And also, I am um, a person who's black behind the orange curtain. Um, I called in today and asked um, the professor some questions. But, yeah, I live about two blocks away from the barbershop that she went and interviewed. The way that you handled the whole situation, especially with Natalia, you know what, I wanted to jump up and do a cheer and turn cartwheels and things like that because I see it all the time. It's that it's that so-called uh, empathy that they supposedly have. I mean, everybody's sad, running around, and, you know, they really – can feel for black folks and this, that, and the other, but nothing substantial, no function whatsoever. And with the professor today, when I called in and I asked her the question, you know, she answered my questions very intelligently, like you said, but there at the end, she wanted to go back and jump into the whole um, Saudi Arabian thing in 1600, this, that, and the third. I didn't have anything else to say because, once again, like one of the other callers had said, we understand that you're dealing with, white folks who came into a territory and took over just like it happened over here. But in the system that we're in right now, the white folks who decided that they were, you know, in control are running the show. It's just like World War One, World War Two. I mean, white folks argue all the time over who's going to take over the number one spot. And the people that have got it right now have a chokehold on what's going on. And I really, it just, it, 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 um, it irritates and almost confuses me to no end when I hear non-white people talk about other non-white people practicing racism. It's just, to me, it seems illogical from everything I've ever seen in life. And, um, yeah, I, I, it was a great show. I like the way you guys handle yourselves. I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything negative to say. It was very instructive. But, um we're going to have to get some. We're going to have to get some better code. I mean, we're going to have to get our words together and become more precise with this thing. Wow! Wow! Did you call in Monday when uh, that went down? Did you were you able to call in then to ask any questions or? No, I didn't call in on uh, Monday. Today was the uh, first time in about two weeks, I believe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Man, that would have been grand if you could have called in uh, live to get get some questions, uh, and to, particularly Natalia, uh, to have some folks who actually live there to to comment uh, any aspect of it. The non-white people practicing racism uh, that I don't know if that happens a lot on the East Coast, but I hear that a lot out here on the West Coast that non-white people practice racism. Or I take I take sorry, take that back. I have heard that a lot. Uh, elsewhere as well that non-white people practice I think that's a default response that I hear pretty regularly that the biggest problem is uh, black people practicing I've heard that a lot now that I'm th- I've heard that a lot 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 uh, that's the biggest problem now it's not white people it's black people practicing racism against other black people and, rah, 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 and all the other permutations that that takes on but yeah that's uh... well one of the things you have to know even about a unique barbershop the place that she went and shot that at is Pierre, good brother, you know, of course. Um, I always defer to my folks. The thing is, is that he caters to a lot of people who are non-white, but represent that so-called Latino, this, that, and the third, the Mexican um, demographic, if you, you know, if you will, whatever they call it. But yeah, he, you know, he has to defer to a whole lot of things. There's a lot of conversations that could go on that don't go on, and in depth conversation about the system of racism and white supremacy won't happen over there. I doubt that I could find two or three people in Orange County that know what the code book is. A lot of that is happening. It's all surface. Even Pierre himself, if she had got deeper into it with him, I believe would have came out and said, you know, I think everybody can practice racism. Um, a lot of the clientele that come in there would come through and say, I believe that these people, you know, that everybody can practice racism. A lot of folks I know that go there run with Everybody can practice racism, so I see that as a as a super problem. Yep, those program speech that has been put out here. Because this is only something that has happened. I would say I've started noticing more so within the past decade, and when with the election of President Obama, it has ramped up over a thousand percent. Where it's being talked about that. We are also um, racist. We are also prejudiced because, no, you got a black president, and he is practicing racism against white people. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. And forgive me for the name calling, but I mean, it was in the uh, it was in the documentary. But yeah, I didn't. Um, if I name called, I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I lived in in that area because there's so few black people there. I can. I can see how it would be very easy, particularly if you're confused, right? If you haven't, if you don't, if you don't study racism, right? You know, you're not seeking out information. Amos Wilson, Dr. Claude Anderson, Dr. Marimba, I need. If you're not seeking out that sort of information, I can see how uh, with the confusion, fear, and then you're in an area where it's not that many black people uh, and you have a business. So you might feel, you know, for your business to thrive that you need to go along with the program and see what you can do to appease and cater to uh, if it's non-black, non-white people, white people, uh, anybody but black people, really, since it's not that many black. I could see how that might be. uh, I could see how someone would come to think that way, particularly a black person. Uh, And I mean, you all had Khalid Flimban in that area. I mean, I can understand completely how a black person would operate from that way of thinking in terms of fear and just doing what they can to placate whites, uh, even non-white, non-black people, if that makes sense. No, you're right, sir. And the thing is, with even with Khalid Flimban, you brought out a good point. You know what? That was never, that was never, ever in the media out here. I mean, OC Weekly, the place that you, that um, I guess they had found the article from that said, you know, where are the black people in Orange County? That paper itself is a fringe paper. It's kind of like an alternative paper where you can go to look at and find... Uh, events and things like that are, you know, that are happening. It's considered to be a liberal uh, publication or whatever, what, what have you. So the French people read that newspaper as far as they're concerned. And uh, Khalid got no play on the air out here. I mean, it was nothing said or anything like that. And yes, everybody has to go along, I guess, to get along is the old, uh, is the old adage that they use. But, um, there is no kind of dialogue out here. People here just want to be, uh, they want to be comfortable. They want a biscuit to eat, to take, you know, to take a phrase from Mr. Fuller. They want a biscuit. As long as they got that, I mean, it's pretty much a non-issue. The Yorba Linda situation, I mean, it, how crazy is that, that these people were enforcement officials themselves and still got ran out of Yorba Linda? That got a little bit of play. I heard the uh, show that you did with the the guy who was supposed to be uh, something as far as racial relations were concerned in Orange County. I, I heard him and everything. But like said, the people got up out of that uh, community and didn't want anybody to know. Didn't show their faces or anything. Just got up out of there and moved to um, Corona, uh, the Inland Empire, we call it, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, that, that area of town. But the, the conversation in Orange County is pretty much watered down as far as I'm concerned. Other than your show and a few other outlets, I really don't get a chance to speak about it. Ooh. I would not want to be out there. I have a sister that lives out there, and she lives out in Laguna Niguel, and a niece and a nephew who were born and raised out there. And they both have more so-called white friends than black. Matter of fact, they don't even, I don't even think they have any black friends, period. Because my niece, she got her undergrad up there with you, Gus, at Washington State. And she got her um, graduate degree at Lewis and Clark out there in Oregon. So. Oh, yeah, I can see that. People. I can see it. I can see it happening all too well. I mean, it's just. The level of, and not even, look, I don't even want to say Orange County. You could have took the black behind the orange curtain and took it to L.A., and it would have been the same thing. I mean, in L.A., you get a few groups who like to get together, do the four-wallism and this, that, and the third. But at the end of the day, um, it's pretty much the same concept. Everybody wants to believe that they're in a melting pot, but in that melting pot, we always end up um, sticking to the bottom of the pan. (laughs) Exactly. That burnt. That black burnt matter at the bottom. Yeah. Mm. Would have been me. Can I make a suggestion? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, can I make a suggestion for a possible guest on your show? Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I, I don't know if anyone has uh, uh, been to this site called the Study of Racialism dot com, and it deals. It, it's run by. I, I don't know. I, when I see his picture, he looks white to me. But it's mainly. Um, it's run by a group of people who classify themselves as multiracial or, or other, and these people have are like primarily. Uh, like black heritage, but they don't want to be classified as black. They prefer to be classified as multiracial. And there's a lot of interesting um, articles on there, including articles, you know, on the scientific aspect of race, et cetera. And um, I don't remember the name of the person that runs the site, but if you just go to the study of racialism dot com, um, you'll you'll see all that information and. Just from the few times that I've been on the site, the I've just gotten the feeling that it's very anti-black because you know a lot of the comments that are made, it's, they make very negative comments about black people, and they even discuss the one front rule and how black people use it and how they've how these quote unquote multiracials have been victimized mainly by blacks. So they put the blame on blacks and not. Uh, white supremacists. So I just wanted to make that as a suggestion. Mm. I'm on their uh, website now. Uh, hmm. Mixed. And also, there's a there's a there are several contributors on there, and there's one contributor I don't remember her name, but she wrote a book in in relation to the topic we had today, and her book is entitled calling yourself what you really are or something to that effect. And her stance is this pro-multiracial stance, even though she, she herself has a black background. Her phenotype is that of, like, someone that is, like, mixed race or whatever you would call that. But her stance is that, no, I'm, I'm you know, I'm mixed. I'm not black or I'm not of black heritage. So, yeah. Confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's white people at it again. That, that, that is why they want to create all of these categories, as I said earlier. It's, it's a way of us to dwindling down the numbers into all of these subcategories where white people would still remain dominant. Because now you've got all of us down here fighting amongst ourselves as who is black, who is not black, and all of this foolishness, and they still up at the top laughing. Right. Racialism, that is a, that is an interesting term. Like, I feel like that's another way that, that white people are refining. They are doing, I mean, this is always, but getting away from saying racism. Uh, they'll come up with all these little cute permutations, uh, racialism. Uh, I, man, it's, it's so many of them where they will get you away from saying, oh, well, this is just racism that we're talking about, or this was an act of racism. Uh, racial overtones, uh, racially insensitive. Uh, they come up with just tons of these. More coming down the pike. More of them coming. But racialism, uh, or I don't even know what that means. Uh, I know they have, I was just looking, and it looks like they have a glossary where they do define some of their terms. But that, uh, let me see if they have the definition for racialism. I'll share that if I can pull it back up. Let's see. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a that's a Hillary Clinton term. I think she had came out uh, one time and said something about racialism. I believe racialism, a belief in the existence of bio races in Homo sapiens, despite the fact that no cluster of geographically co-varying traits has ever been found in that species. Note that this definition differs from that of most dictionaries which define racialism as a synonym of racism. In this site, racialism does not imply any such thing. It simply means a belief in the existence of bio-races. Then their definition for racism, belief in someone's inferiority or mistreatment based on ancestry regardless of looks or wealth. 
For example, when Walter White Cowbell investigated, oh, they're not different. Sorry. Uh, when Walter White investigated lynchings in the Jim Crow South, he feared that he would be publicly tortured to death because of his invisible African ancestry, despite his utterly European looks and his upper middle socio class, upper middle so upper middle class socioeconomic status. Hence, he feared lethal racism. I suspect by this definition that they're leaving the door open for non-white people to be race to practice racism as well. Yep, that's a bunch of hogwash. A bunch of total foolishness. The, the, the whole rewriting and of definition in the dictionary to include everyone into that group because we have no control over everything, as you've stated over and over again. I can be. As loud as I want, get on the street with my microphone and say, oh, what I'm doing, kill Whitey and do all this other crazy stuff. The cops are going to come along and put me in handcuffs and haul me off to jail. What did I accomplish? Not a doggone thing, but got myself at expense because now my husband's going to have to come and get some money and bail me out for being stupid. Right. Right. White folks can say what they want and put it into action. They can go ahead and write laws on the book to say, we're going to redistrict this area. This is going to become a residential to all business. You're going to have to get X amount of days. You're going to have to be moving out your property. This is what we're going to give you for your house. We don't care if you like it or leave it, but you're going to be out of here within 30 days. This is what we're going to give you because this is becoming a business district. It's no longer residential. And they've been doing it consistently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Fuller spoke on that uh, a lot. He, he, you know, he said if uh, they tell you you got to move, uh, you might as well go on and make plans. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. I hope people who were listening, because uh, I said stay tuned, on Monday when Miss Maxwell, when she said that we are hardwired to place people in racial categories, I didn't even mention it. The guest, Professor Morning, she brought it up on it. She used the word hardwired. She said we are hardwired to make distinctions, but she said specifically we are not hardwired to place people into racial categories, which is exactly what I said on the program on Monday. Uh, certainly you can make distinctions, and I think that's what you're supposed to do. Make observe patterns. This is the fat club. This is the thin club. This is the tall club. This is the short club. This is the bald club. You would not be going around and saying, oh, these are going to be the African-American club. This is going to be the Asian group. This is the white group. You would not be doing that if we were not in a system of racism, white supremacy. You would have people, they would just be grouped however you group people. And the crux of it, racial categories are about mistreatment. The only reason for having racial categories is to mistreat people on the basis of race. That is it. It serves no other purpose. And it did seem like we had agreement on that with Professor Morning. But that was one moment where I got a whoopee right on exactly what I That's said. Right. I guess we could we could both be in error, but I didn't even bring it up. She brought it up and she used the word hardwired on her own uh, to say exactly what I said Monday, that people would not be coming out grouping folks in quote unquote racial categories if we were not in a system of racism, white supremacy and the blame for all of that would be on white people, white men, white women, white children. Um, we I didn't even realize it because we started at such a funky uh, time today. We have done our three hours. I did before we wrapped. Did anybody have any uh, other comments about the racial categories being removed from the census and just being white, non-white? Like I said, I'm still thinking on that myself. I could be in error, but if anyone had any, any thoughts on that before we ride, uh, you can share before we wrap up. Oh, yeah. It'll be it would oh, be great, as you said. No, no, I'm sorry, I spoke enough. Y'all go ahead. Oh, I had, you know what, I had just, I was just uh, talking about that um, today, well, yesterday on Facebook, um, about the racial classifications, and somebody had brought up, what about, you know, this classification, that classification, or anything else, and I'm saying, even when it comes to Jewish, uh, Irish, or what have you, those are all secondary because you don't find those on the census. You don't find those on the applications. I mean, the people that can pass will pass. And that's what I've seen. I mean, from my experience, that's what I've seen happen. 
All of those are sub are subgroups. They all know they are white, but then they are English white, Irish, Scottish, whatever you know. They fall down in the subcategories on the white. Mm-hmm. And we were you, we we were the same way too. The people of African ancestry who were enslaved. We don't know what tribes we are from. The, the ones of us out here in the West, the ones on the continent. They still have this continuity. They know because I associate with a lot of Africans here in the Dallas, um, Texas area. And they all know where they are from. They have their dialect. They have their traditions. And they keep them up, pass on those languages to their second and third generation. We don't have that out here as a result of our enslavement. So that's why we got to run around here, come up with all these made-up names one way. We African-American, Afro-American, all this other nonsense that we tag on ourselves. Uh, and 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 even taking that further with California, you know, jumping into groups, uh, we take on African names. Uh, Egypt, we, we want to get some Egyptian names and this, that, and the other. Everybody is just grasping at straws. And uh, most people out here, and I've been told this by people that um, you know are, are 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 that have platforms. Hey, just forget about racism, white supremacy. Focus on uh, other things. Focus on yourself. And all that falls by the wayside. Um, I think that's just a. I think that's a big mistake. We have. I think white supremacy needs to be kept in the forefront because that's the biggest problem. Exactly. That's another escapism that a lot of us want to indulge in, thinking that if we don't speak about it or we don't focus too much on it, it would all of a sudden disappear. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I agree, hundred percent. I think I've been on this site before. The study of racialism. I'm gonna have to check because I, uh, I think I was posting here when the cows started. I'm gonna see if I have a password. If I do, I have had dialogue on here before. I might even be able to find some of my posts. Um, yeah, I'll check on that. Uh, I'll check on that. It looks, yeah, I'm going to check on this um, while, because uh, it looks familiar, just the way that it's set up and, and everything about it, it looks uh, familiar. Yep, I do. You can see if you go uh, on the book site, if you go to the forum, you'll see Gus T. Renegade. Uh, you'll see my post for some of the programs. Uh, the color of wealth. You'll see some of the because I posted under books because we were having the authors come on the program, uh, so you can see uh, some of the early posts that we had and stuff I was posting. And I had conversation on this site, and it was like someone got an attitude with me because I think it was I was using the word non-white or something, and uh, I said, "Well, are you a white person?" And they said, uh, "It was like, wait a minute." Don't be asking that question. And the person like the moderator came on and was like, you are coming dangerously close to violating the rules. And I said, hang on a second. Did I call him a white person or did I ask if he was a white person? Are you telling me that you cannot ask if someone is white? And he said, oh, OK, well, that's not a violation of the rules. But, you know, be can I said, be careful. Like, what are you talking about? Like, all I did was ask him, are you a white person? And the person refused to identify. So I said, well, oh, we're having no further conversation. If you're not going to identify, that's fine. But I'm not going to talk to you if you're not going to tell me whether or not you're a white person. And they tried to get an attitude with me like I was breaking their rules or whatever the case may be. And I was just like, man, I think I even invited them on that bit. Like, you should come on the program and chat it up, you know, if you have a problem or if you have a different view or what have you. But, yeah, if you go on the site and you look under books of interest and you scroll down, uh, you'll see Gus T. Renegade. You'll see my handle. And uh, I suspect that thread, you'll probably see it uh, where I asked the person, is this a white person who, you know, said whatever they said and uh yeah i'm trying to see if i can find in there this white yeah i wanted this white guy he has administrator i wanted him to come on because i thought he was uh, a white person but at any rate um yeah i'll check on it and see if we can get them uh to come on the program uh down the line at any rate uh we will be back tomorrow dr francis cress welsing she'll be on the program uh 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific uh be great to hear from her she was chatting about everything that's current uh 12 years a slave uh kanye west she was super super current on uh everything everything that's been happening what's going on with president obama 
uh, in the healthcare. Uh, John Grisham's new book, uh, which is man, she had a monster quote. John Grisham's new book is uh, Sycamore Row. I think it's the sequel to A Time to Kill. And she said that one of the white characters in the book, somebody was talking about race. I haven't, I got it. I just haven't read it yet. But she says one of the white characters in the book, somebody was saying something about racism and he was talking to another white person and the white person said, oh, it's not about race. You know, cut all that out. It's about money. Uh, This is about finance and trying to get this money. And the white person responded to them and said, race always trumps money. There it is. And I said, "Wow, that John Grisham, woo!" And I, I have that video. It's on my. I'll put it on my Facebook page again. John, I told Dr. Wells and John Grisham did an interview on the BBC this year, and they it was for the I think the 20 anniversary of uh, a time to kill, and he was talking. The whole thing obviously was about racism, and somebody called in and asked him a question, and he said, "I'm a white man." The racism is in my DNA. Yep, he said, <laughs> I can't, uh, I'm trying to be honest about that as a white man, and I try to write about it, you know, in my books, but I can't deny that, and I try to be truthful about it. But he said that specifically, the racism is in my DNA, which goes exactly to what I said to Professor Morning with white people. It's not even about thinking. It's about thinking. It is on a cellular level. Like when Dr. Cambon says that racism has affected us on a cellular level, I think the same is true for white people. Practicing racism, it is in their nature. It is their DNA to take his term. They don't have to think about it. It's what they do. It's how they function as an organism. Mistreat people who are not white, which is exactly Dr. Welsing's theory. White genetic annihilation, all of it, all of it, all of it. But we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, If folks have any suggestions, if you get confused, you can't find an archive, you can email me untiljustice at gmail.com or you can uh, Twitter as well. On Twitter, it's at untiljustice. Twitter, again, is at untiljustice, just like it's supposed to be spelled. No crazy uh, spellings or what have you. Uh, Thanks all for tuning in to the early program. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow if you're participating in the shenanigans that go along with tomorrow. Uh, Be safe. Uh, try not to eat too much. Hopefully there'll be no conflict. I know getting a lot of victims together on an occasion where there can be alcohol and uh, people who are confused about racism, it can have bad results. Try to be codified. Uh, Try not to have conflict. And uh, I guess if you're going to be with family, try to enjoy yourself as well. Uh, But we can share uh, tomorrow in the compensatory call in. And maybe you can get the family to sit around and listen to Dr. Welsing tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Invest if you think the program is constructive. Racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com. Racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com. Uh, my PayPal is in the top right. Listener supported. Invest if you think the broadcast is constructive. Uh, We'll catch everybody tomorrow. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Context of white supremacy. Signing out. I'm a victim, brother. You're a victim. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.